so good evening dear friends uh, greeting from indian arthroplasty association my name is subhran sumanthi i am the current president of the indian arthroplasty association we started our association in 1995 and now we have completed 25 years that is 2020 and this being the silver jubilee year of our association and we have started this uh, webinars uh, and uh, this being the pandemic year then uh, we are more into this web based teachings uh, in order to keep you updated with the recent advances in arthroplasty now you can see more about our association in indian arthroplasty association dot com and uh, you can write your suggestions in indian arthroplasty at gmail dot com or to my personal email id that is dr s s manthi at hotmail dot com now this is the eighth uh, webinar series uh, in our ia 360 degree arthroplasty webinar series number 8 and this webinar has been devoted to total hip arthroplasty in post traumatic hip and uh, today our convener is professor uh, ramesh sen and uh, we have the honor and pleasure having two international faculties today dr david campbell from australia and dr tanamal from thailand Professor Ramesh Chen uh, is the past professor in uh, Postgraduate Institute of Medical Sciences, Chandigarh, and he is well known for pelvic acetabular injuries and complex trauma surgeries around the hip, as well as uh, primary and revision hip replacement surgeries. Professor Chen had a stint in, uh, you know, in Fortis Hospital, and at present is the director of orthopedic surgery at Max Super Specialty Hospital in Chandigarh. and uh, this uh, webinar has been uh, tremendously supported by smita nephew today we thank smita nephew and its educational division for supporting this event now without wasting any much more time let me hand over to professor ramesh and our convener to introduce our faculty and proceed with the program over to professor ramesh sen please you have to unmute yourself so good evening everybody we have this webinar courtesy dr manthi gave me a chance to have to something kind of a trauma to talk about and uh, and this way i'm just getting over so i think my screen is being seen yes so, yeah so the uh, privilege as dr manthi told that we could get well reputed international faculty dr devi campbell from wakefield orthopedic clinic australia and dr natapal from msc university thailand and we in india know all our big ones in this uh, hip arthroplasty as such why we are looking this is just an introduction why we are looking at post traumatic arthroplasty as the literature says that this problem is more complicated with a high rate of failure the other american journal uh, journal of american academy says yes this is associated with greater rate of intra operative and post operative complications so obviously the question comes how often we are dealing with post traumatic hip replacement if you look at the uh, various registries i just started looking around the specific incidents it is somewhere around 10% whether it is a indian registry whether it is a new zealand registry or whether it is a uh, this thing from the swiss registry then i started looking at the uh, kind of a presentations which were there in the journals now in this individual hospital setup it has increased about 15 20% as you can see a series from korea brazil or hong kong then i started looking at my own data how are we different for so i have in last 5 years i took my 5 years data about 1100 procedures of the hip in which we have got 657 which were post traumatic and out of them we had 274 hip replacements and more than 
amyotrophic is as such so what is important here is that among these cases which are going for hip replacement i had one uh, these five years i had 136 cases of estabolone going to hip replacement 84 neck fevers going to hip replacement 14 pipkin going to hip replacement 40 intertrochanteric going to hip replacement and the proportion is something around that 40 50% are hip and 50% are hip arthroplast then i looked at my last 10 years data where i have completed about 210 post estabolum hip replacements and if you see on the left side the problem in india which i don't think will be there in western world or in australia or may not be in bangkok also we have got a reasonable number of neglected estabolum fractures and that is very important that 50% practically saying 40% cases are neglected estabolum fractures meaning by no surgery has been done in those cases coming late then as a pelvic estabolum surgeon i was keen to know what exactly are the fracture patterns which we encounter in these patients many cases we can't classify but primarily you can see that we had posterior wall column and posterior wall injuries or posterior column and wall injuries and some uh, t type fractures or transverse fracture and some abc and associated posterior column fractures in our situations then as as an uh, arthroplasty surgeon you look at the defects according to the standard classifications but as an pelvic estabolic surgeon as a pelvic estabolic trauma you tend to see according to the injuries sustained by the patients and again these injuries we tend to get we had pelvic discontinuities obviously they neglected had much more discontinuities as compared to the operated one then primarily posterior wall injuries posterior superior injuries and then central so called proteusal posterior proteusio and pior proteusio many of these classification patterns do not match with a classical petroski classification and on the uh, trochanter side we see that most of the time the bipolar is the main thing but when you are operating for hip replacement it is trochanteric where you have done a secondary thing meaning by primaries we are failing due to maybe it was a previous uh, dhs it was a previous pfn or that is same for the neck fever where we must have a more of a failures also there will be some primaries also but failures also and that exactly the fixation failure in the, among the secondaries fixation failure and secondary complication like avascular necrosis are the causes for the proximal femur and to nutshell if you look at the literature about estabolum site a number of complication heterotopic classification loosening infection and survival is 70 to 100% revision rate is reasonably high and on the femur side also the arthroplasty has got a reoperation rate 16% we do have a periprostatic fracture deep infection and dislocation so all this is the purview with which we are looking at this seminar and this webinar today with a very prestigious faculty with us and uh, i will now like to invite dr natapal to give overall uh, view of that post traumatic phr dr natapal please yeah thank you very much professor sent uh and share the screen first while dr natapol is sharing his screen i would uh, you know request all the participant to you know write their questions in the question and answer section you will not be able to unmute yourself you have to write your questions there then we will take up those questions and try to answer as far as possible thank you yeah. over to dr natapol please yeah. first of all i would like to thanks uh, indian arthroplasty association uh, mr president dr mohanty and uh, smith and nephew for inviting me to share with you about the post traumatic uh, hip replacement today i'm going to focus on the femoral size and also the acetabular size to give the overview first the spectrum of the post traumatic condition the it will develop the secondary arthritis of the hip no matter the fracture at the acetabulum or the fracture at the femoral head it may cause the ankylosis or sometimes we will have to fix the fail fixation i'm going to give the seven practical points when you have to take care of the patient with a post traumatic first of all you have to rule out the infection because the patient who have previous surgery more they have run the risk of having the 
uh, infection inside, we have to check the ESR and the CRP. Sometimes we have to aspirate for culture. If the patient has uh, some evidence of being infected, you have to do two-stage hip replacement. The first stage is to remove all the residual implant, debride all the tissues, maybe put the antibiotic spacer and send the specimen for culture. And then you eradicate the infection until you feel that the infection has gone. So you're gonna do the second stage reconstruction after you eradicate the infection. The second point is uh, the difficult exposure. It may be from the extensive scar or the adhesion, not only at the skin, but also the adhesion, a lot of fibrosis inside the joint that you have to have a good exposure. You have to decide the skin incision to make a proper uh, exposure. The third thing is about the hardware removal. You have to prepare the equipment for the hardware removal. You have to take a look at the mouth union. Uh, you have to experience the sclerotic bone when you ream the acetabulum or you brush the, femor the femoral size. You have to think about the stress riser after you remove the implant, which may cause a further fracture. If there's a retained hardware, if there's no obstruction, you may be able to leave the hardware inside or you may do the selective hardware removal. Just remove the hardware that is obstruct the fixation. For example, like in this case, there's a lot of uh, screw or the plate hardware at the acetabular side. I just remove some screw that is obstruct the fixation. So if it's not obstruct, just leave it alone when you're gonna remove the hardware. Like on this side, this is a femoral intertocantric fracture. Uh, you may have to consider whether to remove it before this location or after this location. And in this case, you may have to remove the screw before you dislocate. The fourth issue is about the implant selection. You have to make sure that you're gonna obtain enough bone contact. Like on the right side, there's a lot of a stem from the proximal fixation to the distal fixation. Also the same on the uh, acetabular cup, you may need some uh, augmentation or some plate extension to be able to fix the acetabular cup to a good bone. And most of these patients, they're quite young. So you may have to think about the bearing option to make it last long. For example, like in this patient, he's a Thai male, only 19 years old. He has been fixed uh, with a femoral neck fracture and has been fixed with multiple screws fixation, but it's failed. So I may have to think about doing the ceramic or ceramics uh, hip replacement because this patient gonna have to use it for a very long time. This is also another case in female also have to think about the alternative bearing for total hip replacement. Most of these patients are quite young. The fifth issue is uh, to focus on the, what we are gonna be challenging point at the acetabular site. We will have to take a look at the malunited fracture. You may have to consider about the acetabular bone loss or sometimes it's ununited. As Dr. Sen has already mentioned, most of this fracture is ununited or sometimes the osteonecrosis of the bone fragment, retain metal work. And the other issue is about the heterotropic ossification. Or sometimes you may have to dealing with the sciatic nerve injury. For malunited united fracture, it may be uh, difficult to make a good placement for the ideal cup position. You may have to do a good preoperative template and you may have to identify the intraoperative landmark, whether the anterior and the posterior column, or you may have to use the intraoperative fluoroscopy. And uh, sometimes there's bony impingement between the pelvis and the malunited uh, pelvic fracture and the tocanter. So the solution is you may have to use a bigger head, the dual mobility, and have to restore the horizontal offset of the stem. 
The other issue is about the bone loss, necrosis, and non-union. You may have to apply the principle of revision total hip arthroplasty. The implant choice is a cementless hemispherical cup with multiple screws fixation. The femoral head may be used as an autograph in the potential or the column defect, or the posterior plating may be used for the patient who have pelvic discontinuity. Like this case, this is the case in the, published from the Mayo Clinic in BJJ. This is a pelvic discontinuity and they used, uh, at that time, they used the uh, posterior plating and use a cementless cup. For heterotopic ossification, it should be excited to remove the and he removed the, to increase the range of motion of the hip, and it may need the prophylaxis by using a radiation or some non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agent for six weeks. On the femoral side, the challenging point is the stage riser, bone loss, malunion or deformed bone, fragile bone, or fracture of greater to canter. You may have to apply the concept of the revision hip atoplasty. This, like this case, there's a non-union of the intertocentric fracture. We may have to use the, I use the cable grip device and also bypass the stretch riser by using the full cord cylindrical stem and make sure there's enough good bone fixation. This patient is uh, have a comminuted intertocentric and femoral neck fracture, which was neglected. So I have to bypass with a long full cord stem and have to use a Y to fix the fragment of the greater to canter. In some patients who have ankylosed bone like this, and like Dr. Sen have already mentioned, most of the case is neglected. How can we put a good stem in? I use the flexible reamer to develop the canal and then put the small stem in, the taper stem. The flexible reamer and fluoroscopy is very helpful to identify where's the femoral stem. This is uh, just a synergy stem. The last point is about the dislocation. This patient, like the revision hip arthroplasty, they have the higher risk of the hip dislocation. You may think about the different approach to reduce the risk of dislocation. As we already know, the approach from the anterior have lower dislocation compared to the posterior approach. But the key thing, I think you have to avoid the neck and cup impingement. We may use the trial and then test the stability. Like uh, in this video, I test the stability. This is the lateral approach. I test the stability in extension first, make sure there's no impingement, and then I flex the hip and internal rotation to test the posterior stability and make sure that there's no impingement on both sides of the acetabular cup and the femoral neck. This is a case sample. I have two cases. Uh, first is uh, the patient have left hip pain, he have motorcycle accident and have progressive pain after he had a uh, fixation. And then when you see the x-ray, you see there's a lot of the uh, metal work and also ankylosis hip and also have the heterotropic ossification that's nearly fuse the hip. So I get in doing the lateral, direct lateral approach and remove all the HO and then put the total hip arthroplasty in. Uh, I just remove the hardware that is uh, not obstruct the fixation and use the large head and also edge hole prophylaxis. After the surgery, the patient is doing fine. Another case is uh, my colleague's cases. 40 years old male have left hip pain for 1.5 years. He have motorcycle accident. 
about two years ago, and in the last five months, he have progressive hip pain. You can see that it's a neglected acetabular fracture at the left hip. My colleagues get in and use the, there's a defect at the superior part of the acetabular cup, and he used the femoral head to augment the top of the acetabular cup and do a fixation and put a partial weight bearing for three months. So my conclusion is post-traumatic hip replacement have a unique challenge compared to other uh, kind of hip replacement. You have to concern about the issue of the infection, difficult exposure, retain hardware, heterotrophic ossification, bone loss, and also residual deformity. The concept of revision hip arthroplasty should be applied to reconstruct the acetabulum and the femur. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Natapal. So uh, yep. we will have a lot of discussion subsequently. But right mm -hmm. now we can move over to Dr. David Campbell and he'll be talking about the problem in on the trochanteric side fixation overall with the uh, uh, or the post traumatic hip uh, reconstruction david campbell please well thank you everybody uh, do you have my screen right so i thank the the organizers and the sponsors for bringing me to this webinar it's particularly humbling for me in Adelaide because we don't have any near the pathology that I think all this audience had, but I'll make do. Um, no real interest to declare. So my brief is talking about the great trochanter, but in many ways, it is equivalent to the patella of the knee. It's the cause of much of our problems, both exposure, function, and residual pain in the knee and in the hip. So I'm going to discuss three problems. Femoral access due to the anatomy of a deformed femur, trochanteric fractures in the various forms, and I'm going to very briefly touch on abductive function, which we see a lot of. So this audience is no stranger to the terrific success of hip replacement surgery. Number one, two or three, the quality improvements. But when the going gets tough, it can be a difficult procedure, particularly with post-traumatic deformities with which this audience is very familiar. So you're probably familiar with one of the classifications of proximal femoral deformity to define the site, the geometry and the etiology. And I'm going to focus on the problem of the great trochanter, particularly after osteotomy, which we see a little bit of, and those in the UK see a lot of, and a bit of fracture. So here's a classification, the level is metaphyseal. It's a translational deformity due to fracture malunion. Not a great problem for a hip replacement, actually. Here's a similar example. It's a Wainwright osteotomy, similar pathology, translated metaphyseal deformity, and here's a replacement. So fairly easy access to the femur. However, the trochanteric fixation is a bit precarious should it break. Here, it does not always go smoothly. So in this example, it's probably retained hardware. And I suspect the surgeon got lost looking at the grain for cancer. So surgical principles we touched on, exposure, removal of implants and infection, analyzing the deformity is especially important with a deformed femur. So familiar territory to revision principle. So here's an example, planning and templating. Deformed femur in multiple planes. We do a plane film CT scan. So the plan has been planned and the plan has been executed. Here's one of my patients, a great patient, a more complex example. You can see multiple deformities, multiple planes, angular and rotatory. So it takes a lot of planning, but with time and planning, here is the procedure. So pay attention to the great trochanter. It's fragile bone and it needs some protection. So with regard to the greater cancer, it has some special problems. 
The main problem is that it overhangs the femoral canal, the trochanter over the dull will come back to. And it makes access to the canal difficult. It puts the trochanter at risk of fracture. And, the, and if it's in the way, it causes various position of the femoral component. The high riding trochanter itself can impinge on the pelvis, causing impingement, and it causes decreased abduction power if it's high. And we see this a lot in, say, the high CDH patients. So the risks of using a standard approach in some of these femurs is like with a revision hip. We can't get good access to the canal, we can't get a straight shot. So it causes delay and increased time of the procedure and it causes a lot of hazard. So there's some alternative approaches. And we see this a lot in revision hip replacement surgery, particularly when there's various remodeling, which is quite common. And this is what I call the trochanter over medulla sign. So I always look for this. We draw a straight line down the femur. If the stem comes out through the trochanter, we know to anticipate some problems. An alternative approach is very helpful. And so for the most part, this is what we do for a vision hip replacement, where we need access to the stem to a removal. We use an extended trochanteric osteotomy and you can see the trochanter sitting over the top of the stem and it's protected and is securely fixed later on. It also avoids femoral perforation. It doesn't always do well though. So, some particular forms of greater trochanter is we need some solution for access and occasionally we need to change the mechanics of the abductor function by moving the trochanter. And here's an example. We don't do very often in my country. Here's a CDH patient where the trochanter is brought down and secured with a fixation device. And you can do that in a number of ways. We typically use these trochanteric grips and cables because they're really good. But I want to share with you an old technique. We use a bit for revisions now, it's called trochanteric slide. Probably most of the audience are familiar with it with for revisions. It's great for isolated as have exposure and exposure of the canal where you don't need to access the abscess. But I think it would do particularly well for these overhanging trochanters, especially if you want to mobilise them. So we, we maintain a digastric muscle. And the importance of that, you can see my screen. When we talk about trochanters, we talk about trochanteric escape. Trochanter goes north. But actually, the big problem, I think, is it goes anteriorly. So if you look at this as a fracture example, the vastus and the adductus, they don't pull it north-south, they pull it anteriorly. So the net effect, the vector of force, is the, the, for the trochanter to fail anteriorly. It's quite common. So here's a trochanteric slide. I won't bore you the whole details. It's a very easy, economical operation. We localise the trochanter, leave the short rotators if you wish, a slither of bone is produced to produce a digastric muscle with the ductus above, vastus below. And we mobilise the trochanter. And then it's resistant to proximal migration because of the digastric muscle component. And you get a really great exposure of the acetabulum. And it's particularly good in a, in a post-traumatic femur so you can access the canal safely and then secure the trochanter in your chosen position thereafter. So what I want to show you with the, this approach is that you can simply reattach it with sutures through drill holes and that stops the thing moving anteriorly. So we don't do it that much, we use ETOs. Moving on to trochanteric fractures, this audience is very familiar with trauma more than me, but I want to touch base on peripacetic fractures and nitrogenic ones. So we're all familiar with the fixation of the GT fracture with the component of an intracanteric or not. The grips have been a godsend for us. We use them pretty much all the time for these. They've been around since all miles for you know, 30 years or most, and now the contemporary devices have more options. I want to go and show you historically, I still use fender wires and cables. And here's a, a study from quite some time ago from Korea looking at the figure eight wire compared to the circlage, and the tension band wire is the clear winner. It's probably the optimum fixation with a wire or a cable. 
And this is great if you're fixing up other components of, the, of intertrochanteric fracture. And when doing an intertrochanteric fracture, we don't necessarily need a grip or so forth. You can suture the trochanter back on with those Epibon sutures. It does really quite well. Touching base on periprosthetic fracture, this is where I get in trouble with GT more so. We tend to focus on the exciting fractures, the loose stem, the big revision, but actually a bit of the problem is in the lesser grades, in the trochanteric fractures. We tend to overlook those when we talk about them, but they're quite common. They're about one fifth of periprosthetic fractures. So Clive Duncan and Baz Masri, when their description was never validated at the time, when they, de they described trochanteric fractures, they ignored them. Unless they move more than one inch, two and a half centimetres, they proposed to leave them be if the stem was finally alone. But I think that's a bit too conservative. So here's an example of a very old lady with a post anterior common plate from within side and so forth. She presented with a dislocated hip, probably a GT fracture, allowing the hip to dislocate or vice versa, and simple fixation of that fracture makes the unstable hip more stable. So it doesn't always go well. Here's an example of a revision hip with a trochanteric osteotomy and one of the wires and cheese gated through. So here's a trochanter that's not unsupported by biological bone. There's been an attempt at fixation with a grip and it's not done well. And so the salvage is using one of the more contemporary devices. It's a functional hip that's doing quite well, but I'd submit to you it's not ever going to heal. There's no way this is going to stick onto bone and there's the metal, there's no bone here. And you see the mode of failure again, it's actually failed anteriorly. This is quite common. And here's another example, we see this in tumour components, this time elderly patients with a type C bone destroyed. There's an attempt to restore the abductive function with fixing the device. And it probably does quite well, but it's not going to be a biological solution. So what about something we see a little bit in, in, a, in, in the elective world is trochanteric fractures on hip replacement. There's a few small series, all small number, at 30 patients and so forth. And Pritchard from about 10, 10 years ago suggested that you can leave them alone if they're less than an inch, like as mandatory and so forth. And but 10% went on to displace further and they went particularly medially. And those patients, they had pain and they limped. And Here's another example, 30 patients. They're, they're very relatively stable injuries for the most part, and they recommend the fixation if they pain in the midpoint were displaced. Another group, small number of fractures, 26. If the fracture was complete, they did quite poorly, and it did not matter if you waited and delayed fixation or not. So here's my personal series. This the last thousand hips, we've looked them up, we did three fractures, but you've shown them already. This one was identified at surgery, sutured a year later, it's united. This one was suit, was wired, I think a, a, a figure eight was probably a better choice. But if we got access to hardware, we would use a trochanteric grip. And the observation here, these were all caused by not inserting the stem, but actually extracting the broach and basically hit the corner and fractured the trochanter. So intrinsically stable, but a damn nuisance. Again, trochanter over medulla sign that's one to watch for. We see a bit of this in, in, in Australia, osteolytic lesions with less now plastic. The story of when to intervene with these patients is a large story, we won't go into it, but with regard to the trochanter, it's important. With a big osteolytic lesion as demonstrated here, there's one the trochanter, when do you not intervene? Well, the answer is best not to touch a greater trochanter with a lesion if you can especially for fractures. The trauma of fracture will generally establish that eggshell bone to heal, and you can go and revise it later on into a, a healed contained defect, and often flinty little bits of bone, and they will unite. So we would recommend not touching an acute trochanteric fracture and leave most pubic fractures and treat the hip on its merits. So I think that's for fractures. I'm just going to whiz through quickly inductive deficiency, our hip replacement. We see a lot of this. It's about 1% of the primaries, one-fifth of the revisions. It can be a big problem. They have a high risk of dislocation, not resolved with putting in bigger heads, not even capture heads, and it can be a big problem. 
um, abducted deficiency and log ratio of two and a half times of instability, a bit like a form of dislocation, and they don't do well. How common is it? it it's uncommon, but it's the end point of tendinopathy. In our institution, we do about 2,000 a year, and, and, and it's you know, a very small number, but it can be a big problem. So we tend to repair them, occasionally augment them, muscle transfers, and duct reconstruction is quite rarely done. We do with Lars occasionally. I think this has some place maybe in the post-trauma situation. About to do my first one tomorrow. We rarely, rarely do these things, but they're a big problem. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, there are three problems that are a cancer, femoral access, a function of abnormal anatomy, trochanteric fractures, and abductor function with the tendon or abnormal anatomy of the trochanter. So I thank you for your attention. I'll hand over to Jim. Thank you, David. So we do have uh, any questions. I think we can have questions to the previous two talks from within the panel. Any specific queries? Yeah, there was a question you know, by Dr. Wadwa that uh, what is the opinion of the panelist about the removal of implant and you know doing a hip replacement, whether you do in the same stage or you do in two stages? Uh, what is my personal opinion that I do in the same stage unless it is infected? Uh, what about uh, Dr. Natapal? Uh, what would you prefer? I think same as you, Dr. Mohani. I think uh, I check the infection first. If it's not suspected infection, I do it in the same surgery. But if it's infected, I may do it, I may do it two stage. First stage, remove all the implants, put a spacer in, and then after I clear the infection, I do the hip replacement. Yeah. Yep. Dr. Campbell, what would you prefer? It looks like it's very common actually. The Mayo some years ago reported 12% incidence of infection with a previous practice seems crazily high. So if someone's had an infection, I, it, it's part of the history, that would be a stimulus to remove metal, great sampling, but there's been no history of infection I think well enough alone and do the minimal with the, as we've heard the, the test, blood test before, but don't change it too much. One stage. Yeah. Anybody differs, uh, disagree with this or have any different approach? A any yeah. other? Uh, yeah, the, we, Dr. Campbell's point is uh, very valid. Very high incidence of uh, infection in this post-traumatic uh, uh, stabular fractures, not in the femur, but the stabular fractures. So we follow the same things, but sometimes we do what is short stage. So we go in, we will take the uh, implant out and um, uh, two, three days later, we would be happy to, if it's all negative, we do the hip replacement. Yeah. So it's a short stage, two, three days. With no space in between, VJ? Sorry, was that? With, VJ, with no space in between, just removal of metal work and go back? No. Uh, no, we'll put a spacer in, just in case it's infected and then we can't go in again, we'll put a spacer. But if it's not yeah. infected, we'd go in three days and put the uh, hip replacement. Yeah. Uh, no. we, we, yeah, we just audited. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Mohanty, we just audited our, uh, we did about 50 uh, cases where we did, uh, we removed the implant, assuming that this was not infected, and then went ahead and did the hip replacement at one single stage. And then we audited our cultures just to see what the you know, positivity rate was. Actually, about 40 to 50% were positive. And about 10% actually required a washout. The follow-up period is only very short, it's only about two years. So far, none of them had, had any revisions or any problems, but I think the culture positivity rate is pretty high, even in a one stage. Okay. So I, I think I, ideally, ideally one should take a culture from each and every case after removing the implant, even if it doesn't look to be infected, but ideally one should take a culture and if especially there is a membrane associated, one should curate that membrane out and send it for culture. Yes, uh, over to Dr. Sen, please. Anne, what I'm thinking that uh, the cause of failure of the previous surgery is a reasonable indicator that if there is any suspicion of an infection, definitely one has to be careful enough. Because uh, definitely it's a protocol always in any previous surgery to have a culture done as you rightly set it out. But the likelihood 
of even planning beforehand can be made if we are not very sure why the previous surgery has failed off because infection is one of the uh, causes for that. I have a question to David about it. That when we are looking at the so-called the posterior fracture dislocation, when the abductors are injured in the first go due to the injury, then we have got a posterior fixation, done, let's say a sternal fracture fixation for posterior wall. And then subsequently the THR is done because you have to either take out the implant or still to go with that very approach. So three times when you're going through all those abductor mechanism, did you feel any difference in the abductor strength of these patients affecting their clinical outcome or no? No, I don't think so. We, we have patients who mostly operate for revisions and the adductors seem to be preserved with a posterior approach quite well. We did a number of soft tissue repairs for the hardening style approach and a pure anterior approach, we've not had much experience with it. So the real risk is that sort of the hardening style anterior approach and about 30% of those are abducted deficient under MRI scan, but clinically not so. I think repetitive posterior approach, the posterior capsule may be at risk though, but functionally, that's not a problem, but it's a dislocation. So any more questions? Uh, David, I'd like to ask you, you did mention that uh, the um, GANS flip uh, sometimes goes anteriorly. I, I fully agree with that. But is that a problem? I mean, what's the problem if it goes anteriorly? Uh, do the patients have problems with that? Yeah, they do. They get an adductor deficient limb sometimes, yeah. yeah. And I think it's hard to isolate that in isolation because often in trauma, they've got so many things going on. But in a revision hip situation, that's the only scenario. Yeah, they do have abductor deficiency for sure. It's sometimes quite impressive. Now, my, um, David, you did mention that, you know, uh, the various ways of uh, doing a trochanteric osteotomy and the conventional Chanli, which also you showed, that you fix yeah. by a grip. But I think, uh, you know, in 2020, we really must not be doing any type of the conventional uh, Chanli osteotomy. And, and in all cases, you must preserve the continuity of the abductor with the vastus lateralis. Your comparison to the petrella is so apt that, you know, it's equivalent of... Uh, cutting the petalar tendon just below the petalar. I mean, that would be ridiculous, but whether doing a tibial tubercle osteotomy or any type of osteotomy in which you preserve the proximal muscles or the distal muscles will have no functional. And my personal opinion is, even if it doesn't unite, it will not dislocate, as long as the continuity is preserved. Yes, so VJ, I ran out of time. We've got a host of revision hits where there's really nothing attaching to the top of the femur, but they have this soft tissue sleeve that effectively does quite a good job. And we see the tumor guys using those Gore-Tex sleeves. It's got no biological fixation, but, and the abduction function is a bit weak, but they do pretty well. And so no matter what happens, keep, as you say, keep the soft tissue envelope together, even if it doesn't have a piece of bone to attach, that's really important. Yep. The, there is a question from Dr. Mittal that uh, when, what are your parameters to uh, move ahead with the second stage reconstruction in an infected hip? Personally, I would do ESR, CRP and aspiration, a downward trend of ESR, CRP rather than absolutely becoming normal would be a good indicator, but clinical findings is extremely important. Uh, 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 Dr. Mahesh, what is your take on that? I completely agree with you. I would rely um, on uh, obviously clinical findings, but ESR and CRP, if both of them uh, remain negative, I would go in. If one of them is positive, especially the CRP, consider aspiration. Okay, then if ESR, CRP are normal, then you don't aspirate the hip, correct? Yeah, if both of them are normal and you've done a thorough debridement and you've done the implant removal, then I would um, accept that I can go in. Yeah, uh, Dr. Campbell? So my experience is revision arthroplasty, not trauma, but I think it's the same question. There is no test that guides us. Craig Dillavale has written a lot about this and are downtrending inflammatory markers, but they don't need to go back to normal in the hip revision situation. So it's that downtrending clinical picture. And we acknowledge that we'll get positive samples in 10 to 20%. 
So we're doing a one stage revision for infection. So using antibiotic cement, you know, becomes very appealing because we know we're going to have some failures. Frozen section is the other question. And I'm not sure in trauma you get a different microbiological mix compared to joint replacements where it's low virulence organs mostly. Uh, I think if there are no more questions, then we go ahead with the discussion of the cases. Yeah. Dr. Sen, please. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Mahesh, please, you can share your screen and your piece, uh, piece yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Dr. Sen and Dr. Mohanty and IA for inviting me for this uh, webinar. Um, I'm going to present one case um, of um, an acetabular fracture which presented to me. This was a gentleman who is in his mid-40s, uh, presented to us uh, from the Middle East um, uh, with an alleged history of a gunshot wound through his hip region. Obviously, there were wounds of entry and exit, but uh, can't see any fragments here. Um, so this was his um, CT scan. This was approximately four months following this injury. He was walking with a massive limp and shortening. Um, the other CT scan <coughs> showed significant combination of the uh, roof of the dome of the acetabular area and a 3D CT scan shows that only a little, it probably wouldn't fit into any of the particular classification but you have a rim of posterior column intact, which is attached to the axial skeleton. And um, this is a typical uh, both column kind of a picture um, if you look at, um, at it from the front. Um, so this is the scenario. I just wanted to ask the, the faculty and the gentlemen what would be their option. I know Dr. Sain and Dr. Rakesh might consider fixing this. I wasn't brave enough to do it um, at around four months following the surgery, uh, following the injury. Right, my, uh, my personal opinion would be to fix it. It's like Humpty Dumpty that is broken completely. So even uh, we know for sure it needs an arthroplasty at some stage, but uh, taking on an arthroplasty at this stage would be extremely difficult. And I think that term, uh, the long-term success uh, can be questioned. So I would uh, fix it even if I know that I'm going to get a substandard fixation, but I'll get some bone for me to uh, do a reasonably straightforward arthroplasty later on. Okay. Um, Dr. Mohanty, you probably agree with yeah. the plan. We'll fix it. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with Vijay that uh, I will try to fix it. Uh, whatever position it comes, I'll try to preserve the bone and fix it and uh, later on uh, think of doing it totally. But... Uh, Definitely, I am not going for a totally from the beginning. Well, I was uh, probably fool enough to consider arthroplasty. Dr. Campbell, what do you think? Uh, uh, you would it's this. easy for me. I'll ask my trauma colleagues what they think. And I'd be very keen to restore anatomy the first instance. You know, so we do acute hip replacements, but the more elderly females with reasonable columns, we can reconstruct. This is a mess. Yeah, this is a mess. Yeah. So we uh, decided because um, I do pelvic trauma as well and I um, don't like going in um, late uh, in these cases because they bleed um, like crazy and uh, there is not much of bone. I mean, if we see um, the previous um, CT scan, you can see it's uh, just... Mahesh, before you go, I think Dr. Sen has to give his, uh, his opinion yeah. as well. I think he's probably the most knowledgeable in this field. Yes, exactly. Dr. Yeah, Sen, what do you think? Is, yeah, I want to see the posterior side rather than looking at this side because for this side, reconstruction is not a big issue. You go inside, you can stabilize. But for a good hip, it is not this side probably. It has to be the posterior side which has to be good enough. So I want to see the back side of it. Yeah. yeah so exactly. here there is the advantage that we do have some area which really needs good stability. So the question where uh, will be for you is what approach you're likely to use for this stabilization after which you may be able to do a replacement in the same setting also. Yeah, I mean, um, for me, as I've said, I would definitely go by a posterior approach. Um, in this case, considering that I'm going to do a hip replacement. If I was going to go and fix this fracture, I would probably go either um, 
So if we see these X-rays, you could either consider going by the modified um, iliofemoral op uh, approach, the uh, the one Dr. Sain has uh, proposed to fix the fracture, or even consider the first couple of windows of ilioinguinal approach. Yes, because uh, there are two things here: the anterior column stabilization and the posterior column stabilization. Luckily for us, the positive thing in this case is that the comminution is not much posteriorly at the joint level. It is yeah. much more on the anterior side of it, where we can have a reasonable amount of stability, even if we go with the iliofemoral approach. And then I will my turn back and get into the reconstruction of posterior side, so that my acetabulum is reasonably secure. I am not looking at articular reconstruction. I am looking at the periarticular tissue stability, periarticular bone stability, which I think I should be able to manage in this case because the comminution is there in a very specific area. And we do have a good mass of supporting bone around it. Yeah. So maybe uh, what we decided to do was just use a single approach. So we opened posteriorly. And because there was this rim of bone, um, which was supportive onto the posterior column, the idea was if you get some fixation to that area, you would be able to get away with doing a primary total hip replacement. So we decided to use a trabecular metal cup with multiple screw fixation in the posterior superior intact fragment um, of the acetabulum. I should have used a couple of screws in the ischium and into the pubis. I unfortunately did not use it because I relied on a cage um, with bone grafting inside it. Um, and um, we got a cemented cup inside. I've accepted a high hip center, probably 1.5 to two centimeter, which is just about um, acceptable. Um, this gentleman obviously came for a couple of months follow-up. Unfortunately, don't have a long-term follow-up with this one. As Vijay has mentioned, the proof of the pudding is in understanding what happens with this gentleman in the long term. It's probably going to put huge stresses on the hip because of the high hip center. Um, I can don't consider it to be lateralized too much to be uh, a major problem as well. Now, uh, comments, um, Dr. Vijay? So, yeah, put a cup cage construct, yeah? Yeah. So, the cup cage construct works very well in a pelvic discontinuity in the revision scenario, THR, because it's a chronic discontinuity. You know, it occurs over time. And then there is, a, as um, uh, has been emphasized, they are, they are not uh, loose. They have a fibrous uh, union to it, although they don't have a bony union. That's why I call it discontinuity. But these ones are not like that, yeah. So, the same principles does not apply here that you can use the same principles to a post-traumatic situation as you do in a, in, a, in a revision scenario. So as you said, we'll have to wait and see. But uh, personally, um, I don't think those principles apply to a post-traumatic situation. You just don't have that, uh, that fibrous ankylosis, which is not an end point. Uh, this is a completely different scenario. Dr. Sain? I personally okay. feel that if you look at the stability here, the, there is still no uh, much of the stability support from the ischium side. Ischium side, yeah, correct. It's yeah. purely restricted to the ilium side, which if you have seen inside, there was a reasonable amount of a gap between the bones. And I don't know, we need to watch out for that area for the subsequent stability because at the joint level, it's okay. But the supporting yeah. structures need to stay with that kind of a strength in this area. Okay. So thank you. So what um, uh, the indications for my uh, practice are for acute total hip replacement, if you have severe impaction of the head or the acetabulum, if you have an associated femoral neck fracture, significant marginal impaction or central impaction or abrasion of the femoral head itself. So these are a couple of examples. One is an acetabular fracture associated with a comminuted femoral head fracture where I would fix the posterior wall fragment, use the femoral head as bone graft, and do a primary hip probably with a cup, which is um, available with an advanced coating, uh, which is currently available for us. And sometimes, again, as uh, Dr. Vijay has mentioned, in extremely complicated <coughs> fractures with damage to the femoral head itself, I would do two approaches, go and fix the anterior column. Sometimes you can do it through the posterior approach itself. It's not commuted enough. Um, and then use a standard hip replacement. Um, the stem is easy. Um, another example, when you have significant damage to the femoral head, when the hip is left in that position, uh, you can see the femoral head is nearly completely damaged. So the rather, rather than giving that patient two operations in a short span of time, if you're um, 
confident enough to do it, you can fix the anterior column fracture and uh, do a subsequent uh, stray, same stage total hip replacement in the same sitting depending on the patient's fitness. We have seen the outcomes are um, unfortunately poorer following total hip, following acetabular fractures with failure rate, uh, rates ranging between 10 to 15%. Uh, Professor Mayers has published a series where he's done cases of acute total hip replacement and the results have been much better as compared to uh, uh, delayed total hip replacement in his series. Um, as I've mentioned, acute THR is indicated in a very select group of patients, not in all acetabular fractures. And probably in these cases, the results, if you combine the cost, the disability for the patient um, are better than the delayed THR, provided that you're confident enough to do it. Thank you. Uh, Mayesh, I have a question. Uh, yeah. So osteoporosis in an old patient, Suppose beyond yeah. 65, 70 osteoporosis, acute acetabular fractures, is that an indication for a primary total hip replacement or you fix it and do it at a later date? I would consider our osteoporosis is not as a major indication for acute total hip replacement. Majority of the, it is the fracture pattern associated with the damage uh, to the head of the femur, how long it has been left in that situation. And if there is um, damaged femoral head, along with severe combination and osteoporosis, um, then I think you can consider a single stage acute total hip replacement. I think in the last few months, we have done about 15 uh, of these cases, over 75 plus or 80 plus. And yeah. actually it is individualization. As uh, Dr. Manthi said, it is the osteoporosis and especially the anterior impaction, the middle impaction. If there is an impaction, getting it up and getting that outcome is difficult in that case. And that exactly becomes an indication, not only the femur head, it is the estabular impaction, which does not bring a very good outcome in these cases. So it may be better in those cases, have a stability and have a replacement at that very point. Okay. I've got a question for the panel. What are your thoughts on attempting compression and fracture union and putting coupling? Alternatively, abandon fracture union and go for distraction. Do you have a thought either way? Um, so I didn't get your question, Dr. Campbell. It's oh, either sorry. leaving. Yes, yeah, so I think there's two schools of thought. One is to compress the fracture and get it to unite and put a cup in, and it's some anatomical bone. Alternatively, abandon the abandon the discontinuity, say, and distract the hip. Do you have a thought about that? Are we talking about uh, chronic discontinuity? No, in, in the trauma setting, because these are different from the revision hip where they have biological activity, healthy bone, they have a chance to heal. Yeah, I think, uh, Dr. Campbell, your question is very relevant, actually. This is a, a thing proposed by Peprosky himself. Uh, yeah. If you're doing something like acute, where you're going for union, then I think you need to go for the compression type techniques, whether you do by plating or you use uh, screws uh, to compress the fracture sites. But if you are in a scenario which is around three months, four months, where there's a lot of fibrosis, which is holding the bones, but the bones are mobile. In both cases, you can go for distraction uh, and then use a cup to actually hold it in a distracted bone. That gives you that stability of the cup. Yeah. Uh, there's a question mm -hmm. from the uh, audience, Dr. Nitin has answered, uh, Question Nitin Jaiswal, that when do you consider for partial or total head burying in cases of acute THR? Yeah, uh, I would protect I them at least for uh, at least for three months. I would protect them. I'll get them out, uh, toe touch wet bearing uh, pretty soon after the surgery, within a day or so. Uh, they remain toe touch wet bearing for the first six weeks. They get X-rays done at that stage. Um, if you are happy with the position um, of the cup, I would start getting them. Uh, partial weight bearing for further six weeks. So at three months, I'm hoping to get them fully weight bearing. Dr. Sen, if you have uh, achieved a primary stability, would you allow weight bearing right away? Uh, there is an issue with the understanding and the ability of the patient to comprehend that partial weight bearing. If you feel your stability is good, because most often these patients get anterior column combination, their posterior structures is not affected most of these cases. So in these cases, even with a good stability, you can permit them a reasonable amount of a 
ground touching also and at six weeks mostly we allow them a reasonable amount of weight gaining on the affected side and we have seen them doing with the 70 plus or 80 plus patients also they are able to manage that way. Dr. Monty, you have to be very careful with uh, weight bearing in these patients. Uh, even though they may look stable and you might think the bonding will happen, there is a lot of avian happening on the acetabular side also. Uh, and the uh, company literature, which might suggest that four to six weeks, the bonding is very good, may not happen even for three months at times in these cases. So uh, partial weight bearing will have to go on until you are really sure about the bonding happening. And there is no shift in the subsequent excess. I've had, uh, you know, the uh, augments shifting even after three months. Yeah, I fully agree with the uh, Rajput. So whenever we have a critical area, uh, whether in the femur or in the astablum, a load bypass is the magic uh, for it to make it unite. For example, if you have a subprochantric fracture, which you are not able to, uh, you know, you do repeated fixation, none of it works. Multiple uh, nails, you have put, you have put a plate, you have put a DCS, nothing works. But you do a THR with a load bypass, it unites like like magic. Similarly, in critical areas of the astablum, and when you have a pelvic discontinuity, for example, many times what we do is uh, we to produce that load bypass, we will do the socket and get fixation above and below the discontinuity, but we will not do the uh, FEMA. This is to produce that load bypass. And in six weeks, it all joins up like magic. It just joins up like magic. And that's the time we'll go and put in a stem. In general, young patients, RTA patients, they're very young, and we don't mind waiting that six weeks and all is not a uh, problem at all. And this load bypass concepts works very well. The critical area to get fracture union, the subprochantric region, as well as in the pelvic discontinuity on the socket side. I think Mahesh, you'll know. Nikhil has a paper on this from Wrightington. Yes. Mahesh, the question is that uh, in your first case from Dr. Chaudhary, that uh, should we do reconstruction of anterior column and wall and then do the either the first stage or plan for these two stages? Uh, or second stage reconstruction? Yeah, I think Dr. Sain and uh, the yeah. rest of the team yeah. has already answered that question where yeah. you can easily do that. Uh, Dr. Sain, what is your dislocation rate in acute THR? Should we be more careful by Dr. Rajendra Aryal? As I uh, discussed, uh, that it depends on uh, you understand that these patients are likely to have the abductor deficiency. That's just we understand. And this is one of the reasons for higher dislocation rates in these patients. Luckily, we do not have uh, the dislocation as our uh, complications in most of the cases. Uh, out of the 200 cases, we have been able to monitor reasonably well all of them. So we don't have a very high dislocation rate. Maybe that we are more careful in that the initial settings about the uh, amount of activity they do, amount of the postures they tend to acquire in that time. So it is very well reported in the literature, it is higher. But I think, I think uh, this question should be for the lesser models, I think, Dr. Mohanty, not for Dr. Singh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think we'll move on to the next case. Yeah, yeah. next is uh, that is that me? Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, Dr. Vijay. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Vijay, yeah. Dr. Yeah. Vijay, yes. Right, okay. So uh, my focus is, um, I'll show you three cases. So the focus of my presentation is for the juniors to read X-ray following uh, post acetabular fractures properly. And so uh, we'll see how we get along with that, yeah. So uh, the usual advice, you know, in most talks we see about post acetabular fractures, the usual talks would be, you know, you do a CT scan and then you do a 3D model if you have the facility. Then you got to be prepared with bone grafts, augments, division cups, tantalum cups, cages, cup cage constructed, etc. That's all fine. But for the junior surgeon, it doesn't give him a roadmap. So what the junior surgeon is really interested to know is what the surgeon needs to do in that particular case. I mean, you need to have all this, you need to see teeth, it's all fine. But what to do in this particular case? So is there any way we can sort of deduce what to do in a particular case? So, so, so these are three cases of mine. Uh, all are young, youngish male, 44, yellow, yellow patient is 44, the red patient is 51, and the uh, blue patient is, uh, uh, is uh, 38. So they're all really young patients. So, and you can see the x-rays here. So can I ask somebody, uh, Mahesh, can you, yeah. what will you, what is your plan for all three and why? Okay, Vijay. 
Uh, so the first one, which is outlined with the yellow one, it's a 44-year-old male with RTA seven months, treated conservatively, severe pain. So you yeah. can see, you trace the inferior border of the superior pubic ramus, mm -hmm. you see the anterior wall is intact in this patient. Mm -hmm. So you have to trace the inferior border of the superior pubic ramus. Now, if you yep. trace the outer border of the ischium, and take it forward, you can see that there is a defect in the posterior wall just behind the femoral head. Mm -hmm. Posterior wall is malunited superiorly and posteriorly. So when okay. we do the CT scan in this patient, I would expect there should be a malunited posterior wall, which is moved posterior superiorly with a gap in that area, an intact anterior wall, a medial wall is intact as well. So in this case, I would consider using the femoral head as bone graft into the defect posterior superiorly. Within, I will maintain the posterior wall as it is. I, it's healed. So I think right. the scan will see as well, it will be healed. And So in, uh, in, in other words, you need a structural graft for this. Is that what you're yeah. saying? So structural okay. graft uh, with uh, an advanced coated um, uh, cuff. Okay. Uh, it will cuff with multiple. Right. Okay. Middle one, uh, Rakesh, can you take the middle one, uh, red one? Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll take the red one, um, uh, Vijay, but uh, my uh, uh, net is a bit weak. So I'll just uh, come off the video. I'll just talk, okay? Yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the I think the Mahesh's one was the uh, wall fracture. The one which you have, the red one, actually looks like a column fracture posteriorly, which has been fixed. Um, but I think the residual deformity is still there. The heads migrated uh, both superiorly and uh, inwards. Um, mm -hmm. From what I can see, I think uh, the plate's uh, absconding a lot of you, but uh, it's probably degenerative already. Okay. So what do you want to do for the patient? So in this case, first, as, as we do with everybody, we need to get some more views and then uh, probably rule out infection uh, to start with. Yeah, yeah all, that, all that is done. We are now yeah. uh, coming to the, the main part of yeah. the thing. Yeah. So, so yeah, reconstruction. Yeah. Luckily, I still have a head, so I'm pretty uh, feeling good about this one. So I'll go from posterior side and uh, do a THR. Yeah, so you think uh, you need a structural graft for this also? I okay. might, yeah. Fair, fair, fair enough, yeah. Yeah, Pradeep, uh, what is the third blue one you want to take on? Okay, um, yeah, so I, I personally, Vijay, I would definitely do a CT for getting as much knowledge as I can, but I know the purpose of this, uh, what you're trying to do yeah, is to Yeah, then Pradeep, 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 uh, Dr. Bonti, what do you do for the blue one? Yeah, it, uh, you know, of course, uh, I'll do a CT scan later on, but, you know, mm. uh, this looks like a, you know, uh, pelvic discontinuity mm. and uh, it has been treated by a traditional bone setter, so there will be a lot of ectopic ossification, myositis, I, do, I would expect. So I'll go ahead doing, you know, patient has got a severe pain, so I'd go ahead with doing a totally preplution, maybe a cup case construct will be required. And I will see the defects, whether you know that segmental defect or you no know, or content defect. I will use the head as a graft and keep a copy. Right, use the head as a graft. Okay, fair enough. So the uh, message for the uh, the juniors are the following. So this is the first patient. Uh, now we see the CT. As, as Mayesh correctly said, uh, if you're not careful looking at the X-rays, you will miss this point. You will think it's a congruent hip. You think that the Shenton's line is not. Uh, uh, you know, disrupt, disrupted and everything. But if you look at the joint space, you think it's irregular. Yeah, it's a classical sign that there's a subluxation of the hip and this is not a congruent. Although the sentence line is, is, is intact, you have an incongruent. So you can see how in the CT you have uh, a thing. And this, this is a, a functional instability because the head is not congruent. Although the fracture is, is minimal for the CT, it's a very functional instability. So uh, that's well uh, done, uh, Mahesh. So suddenly you need some kind of a structural support, not just a cup would be adequate for him. Okay. So uh, we have put a, as my suggested, we have put the femoral head, which fits into that defect very well. And then we have uh, structural autograft and then we have reconstructed the that. Yeah. So coming to the red case, uh, this is the case and this is the CT scan. We have not used anything. We just done a primary cup and a stem. Okay. We're not used anything. Now we'll come to how, uh, the, uh, looking at the x-rays, we can do those some conclusions, yeah. Now this one, uh, the blue one, uh, I, I'm not the index surgeon. Somebody else is the index surgeon and he has put a cup like that, with screws uh, going inferiorly and above. 
and it, and uh, I, and this is the classical failure mode of abduction. I can almost predict it. I don't have to even uh, you know know uh, the, the see this X-ray. I, I know exactly what's going to happen. So for the benefit of the junior surgeons in this webinar, we'll tell you how it, the algorithm of how to go about it. So the first rule number one: if there is secondary OA, it automatically implies that the hip is stable, and one can get a standard primary cup without any need for an augment or a structural graft. Especially for a junior surgeon, you know, when he needs to put an augment or if, uh, something like that, he probably needs a help from a senior. But uh, which ones that you can take on yourself is one that has got secondary OA. My personal opinion, I've never been wrong over the last 20 years. If there is secondary OA, there is no need for any kind of structural augmentation. I personally will not do a CT scan, but no harm in doing a CT scan. If there is, in other words, florid uh, osteophytes will form only in a stable situation. It will not form in an unstable situation. Okay, that's rule number one. Very important rule for the juniors. If they find secondary OA cross osteophytes, there is no instability there. There is no need for doing anything. Just go and put a primary cup, and you'll be fine. And that's what has been done. There's need for there's no need for any structural augmentation. Very important rule for a for a junior surgeon to know confidently that he can go and reconstruct that. Okay, rule number, this is another example of that. You can see florid secondary OA. Although uh, the hip is, uh, sentence line is disrupted, it has got some kind of secondary stability. And that's why it has become stable. After the fracture is joined, it has become stable. And therefore, the secondary uh, hypertrophic osteophytes make it a stable situation. No need for any structural. You just have to go put a primary cup and come out. There's no need to do anything else. So rule number two. If the hip is congruent at about nine months, why nine months? Because the fracture was also joined. Nine months to one year, then the hip is stable and one can do a standard cup. So the sentence line must be a congruent hip, not like the incongruent hip that we showed you in the earlier x-ray, but sentence line is fine. The patient is nine months to one year from surgery. There is no need to do anything else. You can do a CT scan, but it doesn't help you in any way. You know you're dealing with a stable situation and you can go and put a primary cup. There's no need for a bone graft. No need for an augment. And this uh, rule of thumb, I've never ever been wrong. All these, I mean, we do CT scans and all that, but this is a, it is a very useful rule. So in other words, if there's instability, it will manifest. So you can't say that this patient has got instability. Why? Because if this patient had instability, what we mean by instability is not a wall fracture. Functional instability in that, you know, something is unstable. The head will progressively move up and up with every x-ray you take. Instability will manifest at about nine months to one year. It will not be dormant, it will manifest. So that's another very useful rule to have. So uh, same uh, patient, you can see it. Here you can see, uh, you know, this one year post-surgery, the surgeon does a CT scan and he says, oh, there's a big uh, posterior wall fracture. I may have to do something about it. No, you don't have to do anything because there's not functional instability. There's a fracture, no doubt but it's not producing any functional problem. So you don't have to do anything. You can go in and put a primary cup. So a CT scan has little value. You may find fracture here, there, but what I am interested in is, is it functional instability or not? Is it going to manifest? Now with the presence of functional instability, if I put a cup, the cup will migrate. That's why I'm interested in functional instability. But this cup will not migrate because there is functional integrity of this socket, although there is a major wall fracture. So uh, here you can see that, uh, Congruent hip, uh, you know, so uh, it's now one year, more than one year from surgery. There's no need for doing a CT scan. You can go and put a primary cup. That's all you need to know. There's no need to do anything else. So here is what I'm talking about. The best investigation that you have is not CT scan. The dynamic investigation that you have is a plain X-ray. Good plain X-ray. So here's a patient on whom I have done, Dr. Sen must excuse me. I, this is a posterior wall fracture. So I have done a, a, a posterior wall uh, plating as well as I put a screw there. And you can see the success, three months post-op, this is, sentence line looks to be okay. Six months post-op, you can see the sentence line getting disrupted. And eight months, you can see it's very much disrupted. So what's happening? The functional instability is getting manifested. It will never be dormant. You will pick it up on the x-rays. The most dynamic investigation that you have is plain x-ray, not CT scan, okay? So posterior wall instability gets progressively manifested. So if some surgeon goes and puts a primary cup and comes out, 
I'll give it to you in writing that within a year you will have failure of an abduction. The inferior part will lift up like that. You can almost sure know that's going to happen. So this is needs structural augmentation. So what we have done will need functional instability. Will need structural augmentation. So we can see the bone graft there. Structural bone graft. We use the femoral as a structural autograft. We have put the uh, structural autograft, and this patient is now more than 10 years post-op. Now. Now that we know how to recognize acetabular instability, what can we do about it? So this is what you should not do. You can see that all the sentence line is disrupted. There is no uh, osteophytes. There is no OA. That means there is certainly a functional instability, but some surgeon has gone and put a cup. You know for sure this, the inferior part of the cup will pull out. You can give it in writing. That's going to happen. So the first thing you have to do is to recognize what is functional instability. If you do the wrong management, you will pay a price for it. So second thing is, now is the real indication for CT. When you find instability on the X-ray, that is when the CT helps you. Not routinely doing for all cases. It doesn't help you in any way. But when you have functional instability like this case, you need to do a CT scan. Absolutely mandatory. This is when CT becomes mandatory. Why you need a CT? You have to assess whether the posterior column is integral or not. It's still intact or not. That's why I, I need a CT scan here. So you can see this uh, CT scan absolutely mandatory to know whether the posterior column is intact. So this is the algorithm we have. If the posterior column is intact, you proceed with a highly porous unsimplified cup with posterior augmentation or with a structural graph. So you need some structural augmentation you need. You can use either a structural graph or you can use an augment. But if you don't structurally augment it, it will fail by abduction uh, mode within one year. I can give it to you in writing. Okay. Now, what if the CT scan shows the posterior column is compromised? Then you have to see whether it can be anatomically reduced. If it is anatomically reduced, you do a standard posterior column plating, and then you can put a cup. If it cannot be reduced, we will do a bridge plating with an intercalary graft. The common graft that we use is the femoral head. And this is when I talked about we do it two stages. You may also put the cup, put screws on top and below, but use the uh, plate, uh, use the cup as a, as a circular plate, and then we will deload the hip. We'll do a load bypass. Six weeks later, we'll go and put the stem in. It works extremely well. We're almost guaranteed of posterior column union. And you can see how it needs a structural. Uh, they have the posterior column is intact. So it needs a structural graph. Without a structural graph, it will be great. Now, you can see the another one, incongruent hip. Posterior column is intact on CT. You can make out on the, it's not congruent. And then here again, you need a structural graph. Femoral head is your best structural graft that we have. It has got long-term success in post-acetabular fracture scenario. Unlike in dysplasia, the femoral head is an excellent autograft in this situation. Okay, long-term. Now you can see that again. You can, now uh, I think everyone can recognize what I'm talking about. Chenna's line is disrupted. There's no osteophytes. There's no secondary OA. So even without a CT scan, I know there's instability here. So I need to do a CT scan. Post of all come intact. Again, I need to do a, a graft. Without a structural augmentation, it will fail. Again, same scenario. Clues, proximal migration, shunning light disruption, no OA, instability, functional instability, CT scan to find out column is intact, column is intact. Again, structural graft. And then you do the, uh, the reconstruction like that. Now, what will happen? This is my own patient. I'm the surgeon here. So you can see that this is when I did know all these principles. Then uh, nearly 15 years ago, uh, this is the, uh, you can see that there is instability here. I went in, I, uh, I put this uh, cup in, I thought it was very cup. I put cup, uh, screws inferior and superior, and I thought I'd done a great job. It was 15 years ago, and I can almost guess now what will happen. You can see the cup failing in abduction. It's almost from day one, you know, what is going to be the sequence of events. And you can see that that's what, 2009, that's what happened. Okay? And so, uh, so now the next we went in, put in a structural graft, 2009. And it's worked well, and even today is fine. So you see the key difference between the X-rays. You can so the dynamic X-ray that we have. Now again, this example was the first example I showed. You can see there is instability here. Functional instability is there. X-ray shows you that the surgeon has not respected that. Has put screws up and below. It fails in abduction about a year's time, and you need to have structural augmentation. So in conclusion, I want to say is that the plain X-ray gives most information about the dynamic functional instability. Not the CD scan. It is the plain X-ray that gives you that information. CD is important to establish whether posterior column is integral or the pelvic discontinuity. That's the role of the CD scan. Following these principles will give a roadmap for the surgeon 
and make decision making easy, especially for the junior surgeon who doesn't have all the armamentarium with him. He knows what to be prepared. Does he need a senior surgeon? Does he need a cage? Does he need a, so it gives him a roadmap. So thank you for your attention. Thanks, Vijay. There, uh, there is, uh, again, if you, if you can tell, uh, there is a question that uh, from uh, Dr. Marata, Suman Marata, that what is the most important clue to say that there is functional instability? Well, I just finished the lecture on that. <laughs> I'll go to the lecture again, yeah. If, there is, if yeah. you find there is an incongruent head or subluxating or dislocating head, that will show a functional instability. Yeah, so it has to be, it has to, the Shannon's line must be disrupted. There's no secondary OA. It's going up. Every X-ray shows it's, it's going up. Then you need to have a structural graft. Otherwise, the head is not moving up and you put a cup, the cup will move up. Simple as that. There's functional instability there. So you need to have structural support to prevent it from doing that. That's what functional instability. Quite different from a fracture seen on CD scan. Yeah, Dr. Sen, so do we move or any other questions or anything? Uh, you would any like other questions? Otherwise, it, yeah, if it is not there, we can move further. And uh, Dr. Uh, Rakesh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, next, Rakesh. Need to... uh, I'll start screen sharing, uh, but my net is uh, very dodgy. So if it goes out, just let me know. I won't be able to otherwise know it. So I think uh, I'll just do one case. I think uh, I, I, want, I will actually ask Dr. Sain, whether it's a case series or says one case, just do one case presentation. And then I were, uh, my topic was neglected anterior wall and anterior column. And I just looked at Dr. Sain's series. He's got just two uh, in his whole uh, 200 odd uh, THRs he's done. So it's not something very, very common and uh, it's quite rare. So we just move on. Uh, this is uh, a 30 year old lady who actually fell from three floors um, had uh, head injury, had some abdominal injuries, uh, treated conservatively, uh, but uh, somehow uh, managed only on bed rest uh, for about uh, four months. It's only after four and a half months she was said that your hip is not right and you might need to see somebody. So she actually comes to us with this x-ray. So I think I'll, uh, rather than just making it a monologue, I'll just ask, uh, uh, you know, people uh, what they feel about this. Um, I'll just ask Mahesh, he does pelvis. Mahesh, uh, what do you feel about this four and a half months, 30 year old? Fix, replace, or two stage, whatever. Call a friend, phone a friend. Phone a friend? <laughs> well, <laughs> you just, you just like, Mahesh Kulkarni. <laughs> this is, looks like, um, from what I can see, it's a transverse fracture which is migrated. Um, and in very good hands and inexperienced surgeons, I think you could consider reconstruction of this fracture uh, by using an extend, uh, the extended iliofemoral approach. Um, I wouldn't attempt it. Um, I don't have much experience of uh, fixing these delayed fractures. So I usually refer it on, but otherwise I would think uh, for a 30 year old, that would be the primary management. I think I'll go to Dr. Sain now. Dr. Sain, what do you think about this? Yeah, exactly. I mean, two things I like to know about is the surface of the estabulum, how good it is, and the surface of the femur head, the weight-bearing area, how good it is. If two things look to be good, I'll definitely, because the weight-bearing dome as such is at its own place. So I'll go and get the reduction done and try the congruency of the hip with the weight-bearing dome. As Dr. Such. Sir, it's four months now. No, no issue of four months. What is important, we have done in delayed cases also, if it is reducible, that is what I'm saying. If I'm able to reduce it, it is the first go. If I'm not able to reduce it, I'm ready at the time for the reconstruction also. So the displacement after you take out the, I mean, you have the reduction possibility. Because if it is a non, uh, it is not uniting, it is uh, unstable, then you will definitely have to get back. If it is, comes well and good, if it doesn't come, you are ready for the reconstruction and that's not an issue. But I look at two things. The surface here, the articular surface of the dome, if it is good, and the surface of the uh, femur head. If that is good, we must give a chance to these cases. That is my plea. So what is the approach if you want to go and fix it first? I'll go posteriorly first because the weight-bearing dome primarily, which has to be there, is primarily posterior. You can make it extended uh, iliofemoral or uh, primarily posterior. And I'll definitely go anterior also 
if I am going for a kind of a stability. So anterior and posterior I will go for. And you will so, know when you have opened it up whether the area is good or not. If it's not good, I will do a reconstruction and maybe at second stage I will go for arthroplasty. Right. I will just ask uh, the have, others, uh, uh, Vijay, yeah. So, yeah, I anybody would go straight forward uh, for? I know that a son says that four months, uh, four months ahead is gone. Um, you know, that's no question of, uh, I don't think you can salvage any fracture for that example. Four months, displaced acetabular fracture, the head is gone. So uh, you can do a very complex thing like uh, Dr. Sen said, but if it's four months, uh, my personal approach to this case would be the anterior column uh, is very responsive to um, internal plating. But the posterior column, you got to put an external plate always. Okay. So the I'll put a I'll open up the usual way like a THR. I'll put a posterior plate, column plate. I will I will um, uh, like how we do usually for posterior column. The anterior column I'll just put a femoral head bone graft, and I'll use my cup as the plate. It works extremely well on the anterior column. Yeah, and put screws up and below, and I will stage this procedure. I will not put the femoral stem. I'll do an excision of the plastic briefly, and then I'm very confident of fracture union because of the load bypass. I'll come six to eight weeks and do a step. Uh, so Vijay, because you're going to go uh, first stage, let's say for fixation, are you going to try to reduce it or you're just going to fix wherever it's lying around? Well, I'll try. Uh, if it comes, it comes. If it doesn't come, I, I'm not very uh, fussed about it. Yeah, I will just play it where it is. Okay. Is that, I'll just ask anybody else. Uh, Pradeep, um, any different opinion or you'll go I'll with uh, Dr. Sen or Vijay? Yeah, I'll probably go with Dr. Sen. I'll sort of definitely try and reduce it as much as possible through the posterior approach and get that column there. I would definitely, as he said, look at the head and the weight bearing dome because that's really going to be what is going to determine whether it's going to be a plasty or not, even at four months. And if it is damaged, I'll do everything together at the one stage, both the fixation so, as well as the if you go from posterior and if you are uh, not planning to do THR, how would you look at the head? Sorry? So you'll have to pull it out and you'll have to look at it. Yeah, yes. If you're going to just go for fixation and not actually going for THR, how would you look at the head? I think it's part of displaced medially. You would be able to see it through the gap is what I would see. Okay, so uh, uh, nobody wants a CT or any other views? No, obviously that's going to be there. Okay, so this is uh, one of the Jude views. Anything different? <laughs> Not really. Bicolumnar fracture. Uh, it's uh, what we see on the AP view. Yeah. I think there's going to be a high chance that the dome is going to be damaged here. Yeah. yeah. So I think uh, what this view is telling us, the head's quite incarcerated there. But still, uh, as Dr. Sain said, we don't lose hope actually. We have salvaged uh, post four months. Uh, I've just recently done one and managed to get away in that case. So it's not always that we can assume. The head's always gone. But yeah, here, how, I think, long, how long you got away, Rakesh? Recently you did. Yeah. yeah uh, so, about, I mean, we're looking at ABN, we're looking at uh, chondrolysis, we're looking at so many things. It's not just a question yeah. of, you know, fixing it. it it's you just know. 30 years, you know, whatever you can buy for her, Vijay, it's nothing wrong. So, Rakesh, uh, enough, this, is, enough, yeah. th this Rakesh, is beyond my... Remember the case we did last year, that was one year late. Uh, sir, one year, well, it was increasing every time we went to it. First, we were told it's six months. But before the operation day, we were told it's eight months. The day of operation, we were told it's one year. And sir, after post op, I was told it was one year, three months. <laughs> which uh, we bought it. And that is still working, by the way. That is about four years now, sir. So that is what I want to tell uh, Vijay also, that it was one year old, rather one year, three months old when we did the reduction and stabilized it. So, we, <laughs> I don't think we should lose hope, but uh, this one, I think, is quite incarcerated and... Uh, uh, we have to be very careful in this one. So, uh, uh, this is the CT. I think uh, there's nothing more to add here. Uh, it's just like I wanted to see the how far the column, the particular the posterior column is actually away from each other. Uh, and that's the uh, CT which is telling you that the anterior column is quite a shell here, very thin shell, which is expected, I think. So, that's exactly what telling about the anterior column also. So, the question is... Uh, after the CT, I think the plan still remains what we have already discussed. Um, I think I'll ask my colleague, Dr. Natapol from uh, Bangkok. Is he still around? Yeah. Sir, uh, do you have any different opinion in this, what we have discussed or anything to add to what we have discussed? <laughs> in this case, if I see the patient at three or four months, I'm going to consult my trauma surgeon to maybe refix it. At least try to have some uh, bone left to support the cup. But if it's like a one years or one and a half years, 
no chance to change anything. I will take a look at the postural lateral uh, limb of the acetabulum. If it's still intact, I think we're gonna be able to put just a regular cup in. But if the, the postural lateral part has gone, I think this patient should have the postural lateral part of the acetabulum intact. So I think we may not even need the, the augment. I think what uh, the CT is telling us is that uh, there is some continuity, but it's at a very steep angle. The whole thing has moved in. So rather than being in a straight line going up, it's the line sort of curved in, uh, but it is continuous. Uh, it, only on the CT, it's not uh, yet telling us that whether it's actually mm -hmm. united or not. Um, uh, Dr. Campbell, uh, are you around? Yeah, it's a very aggressive Chiari osteotomy, isn't it? Um, <laughs> very aggressive, yes. <laughs> So when in doubt, restore anatomy be my request to the trauma guys and he would run for its money. And the femoral head's not articulating anything at all at the moment, so it may well be viable. Yeah, so I think uh, uh, for, for the audience who's listening, I think you can understand that the panel is also not, uh, you know, having only just one thought. It's, everything is going, can I salvage the head? If, if the head is salvaged, can I go and actually reduce the fracture? If I can reduce, can I buy more time? Or if it's all gone, can I actually go ahead and actually fix and then come back and do a THR? Uh, anybody would uh, just go ahead and do a THR on this? Would anybody, Vijay, uh, Pradeep, would you go first stage doing a yes. THR? Am I, yes. I will do a two stage THR, yeah. I'd be okay, okay. with doing a first one stage, if it's uh, necessary. I'll, I'll, okay, I'll so, do one stage. Uh, Dr. Mohanty. Yeah, as uh, you know, okay. told that so, I'll try to fix whatever position it comes and uh, go ahead with the THR. Of the so in, in this case, I think uh, uh, whatever uh, Dr. Natapol has suggested in his, uh, and Dr. Sain also has mentioned all these complications. All this is already, quite a few of them are already here. Uh, one particular complication, which I think in these fractures, when you go in, is the, the sciatic nerve is not in its actual uh, place where it should be. And I think uh, it's not a bad idea to start first looking for the sciatic nerve uh, right from the beginning itself, trace it all the way even up to uh, this. In normal fracture fixations, we almost keep the nerve away, look at it, but we are not too worried about it because the fracture is so mobile. But here you're going to go so much of forceful pulling and tugging. So do trace the nerve. Uh, and when you trace the nerve to the sciatic nerves, that's where the superior gluteal artery is also coming. And that's a nightmare to quite a few of us. Uh, so that's something else also uh, to remember. So the approach, I think we've all uh, honed on to that. This is the posterior to start with, and then we'll see what happens. So uh, regarding the in general uh, for THR, I think do what you're familiar with. But I think uh, even if you are, uh, like I think Dr. Campbell probably is, and probably Dr. Natapol, uh, the Harding's type approach. But I think in these cases, uh, almost, uh, quite likely you're always going to be posterior. Uh, so that probably is going to be a workhorse approach. So uh, I had gone in actually with the intention of trying to see if I can do anything constructive about it. And uh, when I went in um, and I you know, looked at uh, the reduction, it just, nothing would move there. So I knew like I'm not going to get reduction at all. It just wouldn't budge uh, with the heading. So I thought like I have to go ahead and see whether I can uh, fix the fractures if the fractures are mobile. So in that case I have to, uh, uh, and uh, what Vijay is saying is also what sometimes goes to our mind that you take away the head and then assess what's happening. So that's the head and you can see like this head's not, uh, you know, no cartilage on this head on all this side. So almost half the head is devoid of the cartilage. So there was no question of uh, actually do, uh, salvaging this thing. So I use this to see if I can actually do. At this stage, uh, while I was looking more for the reduction, I had a terrible bleed from the superior gluteal artery. Um, just for the panel, uh, if you do get this, what do you do? Uh, Doctor Sir, I think you've had plenty of them. Mm -hmm. so what do you do, sir, when you get a bleed at superior gluteal? Uh, definitely, you have to be careful about because if it is involved, you pack it. That's a very simple and uh, standard approach. You pack the area, hold for ten minutes, and then assess it if it is still bleeding or not. Eighty to ninety percent of the time, it settles. It is only when it doesn't settle it out, then you look at the second thing, which probably you have done, put a catheter inside, inflate it, and then again, you can keep on doing whatever you're doing. And when you are done, it's already about half, uh, half an hour to one hour, 
it still settles down. It is only that when it does not settle down, you can still continue the castor post-operatively also if your work main work is done. And after two or three days, you can take it out. So there is a reasonable chance that without really intervening at that time, you can be comfortable from the gluteal disease. I think when I started off my uh, pelvic astral surgery, uh, I've, uh, and that's when you get more of these actually, because you are not aware of where the superior gluteal artery is. And uh, of course, we were taught the packing and we would get away because we were doing on fresh fractures. So when you're fresh, the, the artery uh, can be, uh, you know, uh, quite mobile. So you can actually get it. But when you are uh, uh, in a scenario which is like four months and it is caught up in that fibrous callus uh, behind the sciatic notch, uh, then it is not easy because it's retracted inside the fibrous callus and you can't actually even reach the with the packing. So you can't pack the actual mouth of this vessel. So this is a very good trick. Uh, if you've not seen this before, this is something a very good trick. You can just put a Foley's catheter in and keep it inflamed. Where, uh, just tilt the catheter away from your scene and just carry on the work as if uh, there's nothing happening and come back at the end. Otherwise, if you keep packing repeatedly, I have sometimes done three times, you know, this weight of 10 minutes each and I still haven't made headway. So this is something which will bail you out. Now the head is taken off, as I showed you, this is what the CM image looked like. So what do I do now? Um, Vijay, uh, I think you, you want to pack this and come back second stage? I think my voice is gone. Am I audible? No, no you are audible, clearly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you asking about the bleeding? No, no, uh, the bleeding has stopped now. Uh, with the bleeding has stopped now. The, the gap which you are seeing, see now you can see much better. Um, yeah, you can see there's a, there's a bicolumnar not defect there. So my plan remains the same. Uh, reduce it as much as possible, put a posterior plate and use my cup as my anterior plate. That would be my plan. So, Dr. Natapol, uh, something different or same? The same. same. I did the same. I have to fix it first. So you want to fix it and graft it and uh, do THR or leave it? I'm going to fix it and leave it first. Okay. So Pradeep, for you? I'd probably plate it, uh, bone graft it, and do the acetabulum at the same time with screws inferiorly and superiorly to whatever extent is possible. It'll probably be slightly medialized. I'll try and get it as much possible as possible to get that reduced because the dangers of the cup may actually be medialized. So is this functionally stable or unstable? I would think it's unstable at present. I do have I a think question. Vijay was telling us to look at subsequent x-rays, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You were saying, sorry, you were saying something. Yeah. One question to Dr. Vijay. I mean, uh, you say the posterior plate, but I feel in this kind of a situation, only posterior plate might not be able to give us that kind of a stability. We will have to stabilize because it's a transverse kind of a situation now. And that two displays, when we are pulling it down, we need a reasonable amount of a stability in that construct along with the graft, obviously. But we need anterior stability also, anterior column also, as well as posterior column also. No, I fully uh, agree with you, yeah. So the, my plate is going to be my... My plate is going to be my anterior reconstruction. So I'll graft the anterior defect. I will put a highly porous cup and use the superior and inferior screws. And that's my plate. That's my anterior plate. But I'm plating it from the inside of the socket. Uh, Dr. Sen, would you put a posterior plate and uh, just to cut the matter short, uh, will it be possible for you to pass a screw in the anterior column? The problem is in a fresh injury, in a fresh fracture, when the reduction is possible, the strain over a screw is not much. But when you are reducing it in this kind of a old situation, when the soft tissues will not permit that kind of a stability, we need both the fixation very well. And that is one area. Maybe that we have grafted it adequately well inside it and we don't get much of the strain in that uh, stability of fixation. But it's as a transverse component and considering the kind of forces which come out, I will ensure, I'll ensure that my entry column is also adequately supported rather than expecting my cup to have that load. I want the substrate to have reasonable stability. So you will do again in the two stage or? In uh, this situation, I might go for two stage because this uh, instability is significant as we are reducing from the four months old held position. Okay, go, go ahead, Rakesh. So, uh, Pradeep, I think... Uh, I, I think I totally before. take what Dr. Sen said. 
I totally take what Dr. Sen said. With his experience, I think that's something we need to take. We do. Uh, well, Pradeep, I was on table. Uh, and I tell you, I just couldn't move these fragments. Uh, it was just not moving. Uh, so uh, it's a not terribly unstable scenario here. So I initially just put a cup in there. And initially, the fracture was highly uh, stable. And when I reamed and I started putting the cup, and you know, you have to bang the cup in. I suddenly found slight movement, so which was highly unstable, uh, became slightly unstable. So should we accept this with slight movement of cup and hope the screws will do the job or should we do something different? Uh, absolutely, absolutely not. Yeah, a cup that is mobile, uh, it will not, it will, it's only a matter of Very time. Very tiny bit fails. movement, but it did move. Uh, from so the what the reaming no, was uh, compared to no, no, it's a question of uh, you know pregnancy is it stable or not stable you know a tiny yeah. movement or whatever movement <laughs> is it stable or not i mean that's one of the uh, prerequisites for osteo integration isn't it so if a stable cup will have only fibrous union it will never be osteo integrated so you need to have stability of the cup is it is it stable or not and if it's not stable i wouldn't accept it for sure whatever may be the situation. Yeah, so I think uh, that's a message, a uh, very strong message to be given out uh, that do not accept any cup which is not stable. Don't think mm -hmm. that the screws are going to bail you out. Screws are there just as a protection really, but not to provide you stability. So the cup inherently should be stable. So I came back out and it was then, I, even, you know, I had tried uh, to see if uh, most screws will give, but it didn't. So I had to come back and actually put a plate, uh, plate on that. So we, once we put the plate on, then the constant became quite stable uh, and then it was uh, highly stable. So, uh, Dr. Sain, so you still think I should have put an uh, anterior column on this, uh, plate on this? I, I this is a 30 year old. Uh, no, I am not sure how good uh, the stability you have got of the anterior side of this transverse part because the posteriorly you have reduced it, stabilized. If you have added a lot of graft inside and the whole head is inside, yeah, whole head. And uh, you can see from then, the, behind the cup. There is no more space left there. Okay, if that is the kind of a situation that we may be able to uh, get it over. Otherwise, my always question remains that it is the posterior part of it and if any has, which has already said it, there should be no unstability at this point. That's what I mean. So, uh, yeah, that message I think is very clearly given and I think that's why I put this case up also that I had to come back actually put a plate on, get that stability and then go ahead and actually finish the uh, cup side. Uh, now, did, you um, put, did you put anti grafts, uh, Rakesh? Uh, all around. Uh, you know, yeah, more graft okay. actually in the defect, but also on the anterior side. But it's, anterior side, the coverage was okay. Coverage was not a big problem. It, it's critical that you put on the anterior defect as well, because yeah. you want the anterior columns a bit as well as Dr. Sen keeps saying here. Yeah. True. You know, so Rakesh. I think, uh, sorry, Pradeep. Yeah, Rakesh is very similar to what Dr. Campbell was asking. I mean, you, it's that you got your posterior plate, but even then, anteriorly, you really do not have that kind of stability that you would have liked to get. So um, the question about this distraction uh, cup that you're putting in yeah. a distraction, do you think this applies here in this kind of a situation where you put in a slightly larger... Uh, yeah, so here, that? that's, where exactly, that's where exactly you could do two things. One is the distraction technique, but you know, you need a good... With the plate, distract with the plate. Uh, no, you can't do uh, with a plate. It's like a distractor instrument you need for that. You need to really distract and quite a heavy loads are given onto that. So for me, I'm happy with a plate and actually, you know, uh, provide that stability, even at this stage. No, I think so we that is something mix, uh, Pap that's something no, which Paprosky uh, talks about. Um, not many people believe in that, by the way. No, that uh, Paprosky technique works uh, very well, provided it's in a, in a chronic discontinuity. In a Even chronic, in a post yeah, in a post traumatic situation, uh, this just doesn't happen. Yeah, so I don't think we should apply that concept at all here. The distraction yeah, yeah. technique is not to be used in post traumatic situation. It's completely yeah, a different that's, yeah, concept. That's exactly my experience. Uh, Rajput said two cases. I had seven neglected uh, discontinuities and two fresh, uh, two stabilized one. So out of eight or nine, I tried this technique just uh, before doing this thing by getting bigger and bigger this thing but it always keeps on increasing more and more so not as we just said it, it is not indicated for a post-traumatic uh, discontinuity not at all so that's my catheter still there and i'll finish the operation and it's now the time for the catheter to come out and see see now even if it bleeds i can pack it can and come back in. Oh, yeah so it. i think i'm done now so that's, so that's a, just a small message uh, as dr natapol said young patient 
uh, we had a good uh, coverage so went on ceramic on ceramic that's the post of extra you can see now like uh, i don't think i had a problem with this one uh, last i heard she was actually going on a motorbike mm -hmm. so i think i'll st stop this 2619 sorry <laughs> you know the bike bike number you're talking about <laughs> no no your last slide shows that a uh, year 2619 Um, I have to go back to the slides, and I don't know what. Okay. <laughs> so, are there any questions around? Now, there is a question from there is a question. One question, Dr. Nitin Jaiswal is asking: Is there any role of MRI to look for the viability of a, a head in this particular case? Anybody yes. would do a MRI? No, if we are looking at a salvage in any case, which is a delayed dislocation, and definitely AVN, as we just said, is a big danger. It is advisable beforehand. Uh, for planning purpose so if you feel it is already a vascular head there is no use of getting that reconstruction done definitely it is required um, i'll just ask you in this scenario uh, dr said you got a lot of papers uh, published on avian in uh, these scenarios hmm. um when do you think the mr actually becomes positive in these cases three months it is uh, months. when you are looking at a dislocated hip uh, for the first three months if you keep on getting mr at six weeks 12 weeks there are many changes which you have got an mr i am not talking about dynamic mri dynamic contrast mri which can tell you at any time but in a standard mri picture we take three months as a criteria if the finding of a vascular tear appears at three months it is definitely a vascular you want me to fix and i am finished okay but otherwise many changes which you see initially in the first two months tend to settle down by third month after this dislocation so my always advised all these patients with the dislocation hip is that get an mri at three months to be sure of Whether it is going for AVN or not going for AVN. So, sir, if you, within two months, if you are going ahead, when MRI is not going to be very conducive, then do you do that uh, uh, suction method, the aspiration? No, in that case, we are likely to be okay. But that you said it's a four months old, so definitely. No, no, mine was uh, delayed. I'm just talking about a hypothetical scenario where uh, no, before those three months. No, in those cases, we are able to get it. In, uh, there is a uh, second thing. What kind of a dislocation? If you are looking at a pure posterior dislocation, the chance of AVN are reasonably high. If you are looking kind of at this kind of a dislocation, the chances of AVN are not very high. Yes, this one is good. Next, uh, can uh, I add? Can I can I add one point here? Yeah, just uh, more thing. Now the yeah. uh, new Smith and Nephew cup, you know, you have with the locking screws, dedicated locking screws for ischium and pubis, and uh, they are all locked screws in the cup. That's a phenomenal device to use in this situation. Yeah, because when you are looking for stability, just like you know trauma situation, when you put lock screws. Construct of the whole construct stability uh, goes up. Even if your screw is not very, uh, you know, doesn't have good bone purchase, still it adds to the the overall construct. So in this situation, using a locked construct is invaluable. So I'd like to give the tip to everyone. In these situations, the new Smith and Nephew cup, uh, cup with the uh, locked screws, inferior, a dedicated one for the ischium and pubis, absolutely brilliant choice of implant for this particular situation. No, but it's just uh, one I thing about. I mean, it's got very dedicated holes. In fact, uh, to go into PVC and ischium, but you still are using a cemented cup in that. So what? So no, what? No, it's got I'm not saying. But cemented uh, poly is uh, has got long term success. You don't have to worry about that. It also gives you the option of changing the version and all that. So you can use the uh, the cup as a plate, as a, as a circular plate, rather than using a circular locked plate. Great device to use in this situation. And use the poly wherever you want to use it. Yeah. So Rakesh, uh, can ischial screw would be an ideal question from Dr. Karthik Patel through the cup and pubic screw also? Yeah. So uh, that's what Vijay exactly has brought out. You know, the, that redout cup with the Smith nephew is actually a very dedicated cup for uh, these scenarios. Before, I think uh, we had this T mars where you would take out and actually start drilling it. Uh, I didn't actually know whether the ring uh, taking out is a good idea or not, but that's what people would do and. Uh, try and get some screws, but still the angle wouldn't be really right. This this cup, the angles are really absolutely right, and it's made like that. It will go into that uh, bone where, when you try. You don't need to change uh, your angles. They are dedicated to go into pubis and ischium if you put the cup right. Okay, I, th I think we'll move ahead with the next case, uh, Dr. Pradeep. Please, you can okay. have your screen. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sen. I'll try and share it now. Right, are, we, are you able to see the screen? Yeah, sure. You able to see it? Yeah. 
Okay, right. Um, I've actually shared these, uh, this particular case I've actually shared with Dr. Campbell's and had uh, sort of discussed this with him. So he's quite familiar with this case. I think Mahesh has also seen this particular patient. Um, okay, so this was a patient. Now I, I'm going to say, assume that this was an acute fracture. This is obviously not an acute fracture, but if this patient had presented to you acute, uh, how many in the panel would do uh, ORIF? This is a 70-year-old gentleman who's come uh, with a fracture. How many of you would do a plasty? Would any of you do a plasty or would you do an ORIF? Uh, Rakesh? Yeah, fixation. Anybody for a plasty of an acute situation? Uh, we, uh, we base the decision on, uh, on CD scans. Yeah. On CD scans. I want to look at the, the trochanteric fragment. If it's communicated, I will offer him an arthroplasty. So... Sorry, I prefer arthroplasty. It's an unstable intertrochanteric fracture. So, I mean, what you're trying to say is for all unstable intertrochanteric fractures in seventies, would you do uh, um, arthroplasty, or would you sort of do you have any criteria for doing arthroplasty for these kind of patients, for unstable intertrochanteric fractures? Uh, in my opinion, if it's comminuted and I don't think it's going to be able to fix it easily and the patient is old, maybe I, uh, I prefer uh, bipolar more than, the, more than the fixation. Okay, we'll come to that a little later. Now I'm going to tell you that this patient actually came two years after the fracture. He had not done any treatment for two years and he's now presented two years later. This is another view. Um, yeah of the same um, X-ray and um, sorry, yeah, okay, there, there's actually a CT scan there. So you can see the trochanter is there and that's the posterior part. You can see that actually comminuted, but it's sort of partially united. So that is your X-ray that you have. Now for the panel, for discussion, you know, what kind of stem would you use, cemented or uncemented, and what are your options for your GT fixation? And I left the last question open. Cup hemi by dual. Uh, may I answer? Sure. I do a uh, echelon stem full coat to bypass the fracture and do a total hip replacement for the cup. You can use any kind of cup and use a large head, 36 head, and I'm gonna wire the tokentric fragment down with the wide side technique. Okay, so you'd wire the trochanter and you want to do a THR, is it? Yes with the normal size cup? Mm. With the normal cup or? With, I, I think with the normal cup, not, I don't think it's uh, really need a dual mobility. Okay. Yeah, I, think, I think 36 head is enough. Um, Rakesh? Yeah, Pratik, for me, it will be a uncemented stem, a distal fixation stem. But uh, right. my main uh, criteria about uh, you know, going for a bipolar or a THR would depend upon what my trochanter fixation is going to look like. If it is going okay. to be dodgy, I'll actually bail out with a bipolar. But if the trochanter is good, I will still not do just a normal cup. I'll at least do a dual mobility on this. Okay, so you do a dual mobility. Uh, which at least. Is um, yeah, so we have lots of experience on this. Um, certainly not a bipolar. I do a THR because, uh, uh, you know, patients who present late, uh, who are not loaded the hip properly, uh, they are invariably bipolar becomes very painful for them. So I will do, uh, unlike Dr. Tanabol, I won't use a echelon stem, I would use a titanium stem, distal fitting titanium stem, because that helps in the fracture union. So I'll make sure that I do a correct osteotomy, sort of osteoclasis, so that the trochanteric fragment is continuous with the abductor and the vas lateralis. I would use a titanium distal fitting stem, and then I would wire the trochanter back. So you just wire it back and that should be sufficient for you. Absolutely. Would sufficient you, for me. The, the reason why I asked is, I mean, you got these presentations. Um, what about these cables? What is your opinion on these cables? What do you use them? As I said, uh, sort of uh, before we started that uh, today, 2020, there's no indication for uh, dissociating the trochanter off like that. It is always iatrogenic. It never happens in, in trauma or anything like that. It's only iatrogenic that we, uh, we take the trochanter off like a conventional uh, Charlie astronomy, it never happens. So uh, as long as you preserve this, it never uh, flies off. It's always there. So a, a wire is more than enough. 
But when you do a conventional trochanteric osteotomy or the previous surgeon has done it, that's the only indication I would use a, a, a clamp like this. Otherwise, I have no need to use a clamp. Mahesh, do you have anything different to say? Um, no, really. As Vijay has mentioned, I have um, I rely on fibrous union of the trochanter, especially in such old cases. So you may not have to use very um, tricky reconstruction options from uh, the point of view of um, reconstruction of trochanter. But otherwise, uh, tapered, fluted, titanium stem, and a dual mobility cup um, uh, for on the acetabular side. Okay. Any, and uh, as any particular reason why you wouldn't do a hemi? Vijay has already mentioned his reason why he doesn't want to do a hemi. Do you have um, any different thoughts about it? Or? I mean, this the patient, patient is physiologically active. 70 years old, he's obviously been walking around for two years. No, no, 70 years old, you know, it's just a physiologically active. Go ahead yeah. with the totally people. If the activity is limited, I would go ahead right. with the bipolar. Right. And okay. two weeks, depending upon the associated medical problems. Sure. Dr. Campbell, do you have anything else to add? Look, if there's community ambulator, we would try to use a high quality acetabular component rather than a bipolar. Um, our registry says bipolars are good, but if you've been walking on it, it's very osteoporotic. I'd rather use a, a cup. And what about the trochanter? What would your choice of fixation be? Yeah, it's a bag of bones, so try not to interfere with it too much. If I could, I would sneak in, um, remove the femoral head and neck in routine fashion, then cobble up the trochanters, like what they do with the shoulders, really, not touch it too much. Right, so uh, just cobble up the whole thing and leave it there. Are you worried about uh, st instability because of the fact that the trochanters are sort of separate? And there's yeah, an audio in there? Yeah, it's probably a big bag of bones in the trochanter actually. So try to salvage whatever can be made. And it may be quite now rotated, but that's it's adapted to it quite well and it'll be contracted, leave it there. Right, so basically when we went in, this is what we've done. We have done a dual mobility here, and like Vijay said, we have put in the Wagner stem. Now, this particular plate, we actually put it, we have actually used not wires, but we've used the orthocord to try and keep the trochanters together. This particular shaft was actually quite hollow, and there was actually there was, um, no uh, hold all over this particular trochantric fragment over this stem. Uh, to try and reduce the uh, mobility and uh, between the proximal and distal fragment, we put this probably as a substitute for this particular plate, which we thought may be required. Now, um, this probably was not required. Now, he was actually walking post-operatively, but 10 days later when we saw him, he had actually, um, we found that there was two centimeters shortening of that particular limb. And this is what we actually found. He had actually tried turning prone while in bed and there had been a dislocation, and uh, this is what has happened. Now, so panelists, you can, can you uh, sort of, um, you know, discuss as to why do you think this had happened? Uh, Pradeep, I couldn't understand where did you put that plate uh, and... Uh... Okay, so you can see this, in this particular X-ray, you can see there's a huge trochanteric bit there. Okay. So there are actually three screws through this fragment and the remaining is through the bottom fragment here. The reason, the aim, was to try and reduce the mobility between the proximal fragment and the distal fragment to try and reduce the chances of dislocation. This probably was a bad move as you can see, and this is the x-ray that's there. Comment on why this, why do you think this occurred? And uh, we'll do that first. Why do you think this has occurred? He obviously tried to turn prone, but is there anything that we could have done to prevent it other than just wiring the trochanter? Well, the stem must have subsided, isn't it? Subsidence. Yeah. Well, it's just 10 days now. Doesn't matter. Uh, subsidence can occur uh, two days also, yeah. Yeah. The only thing I can think of is subsidence, yeah. The dual mobility cup. Okay, any other comments? It has is to be the pinching on the trochanter escape. Yeah, so actually what happened here, this case, as I said, this guy had tried turning prone and in the process it is possible that you know during the time it must have dislocated and during the dislocation you can see that the screws from here is from the distal fragment that the screws have actually come out so there was a differential moment obviously between the proximal and the distal fragment of the screws had actually actually pulled out and gone out there so the whole business of putting the plate was probably not a very good idea 
The other thing is that it probably may have been a problem with the length and the offset of the stem. That is the other possibility that could have caused a dislocation. So now with this kind of a situation, what would the what would your next step be? Mahesh? Yeah, what kind of cup is this? Is this a striker cup? Uh, I don't remember. I, um, this is a dual mobility. I mean, I don't I remember which cup it was. It's only striker with the one with the... Yeah, uh, probably. And that's not anybody else. Thing. If it is, um, I will have to, you'll have to understand what cup is in place, whether you can exchange that dual mobility to a constraint liner as a last option uh, on table. That is first thing. The second thing is obviously to check for the subsidence of the stem. Um, there's a fracture it, here. And the stem is actually fractured here and the plate has come out there. Fractured, so it's, then you have to remove this stem and go yeah. for a longer stem. And I will, as you will see that the canal starts flaring up here. So I would be prepared with a distally locked stem as well, just in case I don't get purchased with another longer length Wagner stem or a bigger diameter Wagner stem. And then use cables to uh, get the trochanter fragment back into place and make sure that you have reattached the greater trochanter as well. Right. And you probably will get away with a dual mobility if you can get a better stem. But in spite of doing that, uh, you find that the hip is still unstable, then you might be have to be prepared with a constraint liner with a striker with a, a trident 50 or more you can go for a constraint liner so uh, Ra yeah rakesh or vijay anything else to add yeah pradeep that's why you know um, i'm very uh, reluctant to do a thr when the trochanter things i'm not very happy with because i've seen these dislocations happening even though we might blame the trochanter plate or whatever coming off but it's a risk we take when we do a thr now I think uh, you might need a more robust system to reattach the trochanter. So now that cable uh, ready grip system uh, might be a good idea to do now, along okay. with a change of step. Yeah. Uh, no, the fundamental point is here is not an abductor deficiency. The trochanter does not play a part. Here's a subsided stem. A dual mobility will dislocate if the stem subsides. Other modes of dislocation is very uncommon with the dual mobility. Uh, mm -hmm. Even when you have abductor insufficiency, we use it all the time. It does not, but a substrate stem where it is not restored, I mean, you restored the offset very well with the stem, but when it's gone down, the dual mobility has got no chance. So uh, my uh, approach would be this, I will not put a longer stem. I, there's a fracture there that's made it subside, but there's still uh, some amount of canal there. I will use the same length of the stem, but I will use a much bigger stem than this. I will make sure I get good distal press fit. And I'm happy to use the same uh, cup and I will do that. I'm not interested in reconstructing the abductor. I would do a wiring for the abductor. Okay. Yeah, so what we did here was, uh, we did think of these options, but we did not use that, uh, those cables. We have used a modular stem. The reason why we did this was exactly what uh, Mahesh was saying. We wanted to get a good distal fit. We wanted to make sure that we had a good distal fit. We were also worried whether our primary fault that we did was something to do with the length and the offset. And that's another reason why we use the modular stem so that we could actually adjust the offset and the length to get better stability if we had problems using a single stem. Um, and we have again just wired the uh, trochanter just using orthocord again here. And we continue to use the dual mobility. We have not used a constrained liner. Our patient's only about uh, three to four months down the line. So I really do not know what's going to happen to this patient subsequently. Now, we, just can for, bring this, uh, we can bring this argument now. I think we can ask the panel also. Uh, what is really good uh, to do these wirings? Is it a stainless steel wire? Is it the cables or is it the ortho cord or even a T-bond? You know, what is really a good way to tie these things up together? Yeah, let's ask. What is the uh, panel Dr. Yeah. Dr. Campbell, do you want to take the first go because you gave the talk on that? Yeah, look, the choice of wire is interesting. One of my colleagues did a lovely study looking at comparing the, the plastic cable versus um, double wires versus uh, the cables. And no surprise, the cable is the strongest initially, but at six weeks, the plastic is stronger. It does not lose its strength. And the wire was the weakest. Another cool trick I've never done is to pass the cable around twice, actually. I've never done that. That was Marcus Gusta. So I'm not sure whether having 
the wire for six weeks is good because I've got one like this and the wire, she's grated through and cut the femur in half at about three months. So it may be that having lost some loss of fixation might be a good thing. Vijay, you want to take it on? Your yeah. Um, so, so what I would do is, you know, uh, use as a tension band wire to neutralize the forces and that has worked uh, very well in our hands. This term also has got holes for you specifically for that. They put a figure of weight here that works extremely well. Now, um, uh, differing with what you and uh, Mahesh say, uh, it's a sort of a, it's intuitive to think that if you use a longer stem, you will get more fixation. It's quite the contrary. If you, if you go for a longer stem, you may get less fixation because, uh, you know, you'll, you'll touch the cortex at one point. Then you can't size the stem adequately. So um, it looks nice on the x-ray, but there's no fixation here. You size the stem correctly. I'm not saying you're not saying, but you get a better chance. The important thing is you have to find out whether there's a cylinder for you to play with. If there is no cylinder, then you have no. If the cylinder, we convert it into a cone by reaming, and that's where a fixation need to be. Even a short segment fixation, I'll be very happy with a three to four centimeter fixation. But I need to get my stem really, really solid in that area. You may have a longer stem, but that does not add value. It actually uh, may be a, a problem because it'll touch the cortex, and then you will not be able to size your stem properly. Yeah. So I would. Uh, I would have gone for the same size stem, provided, of course, that my fracture is not coming to the expanded area. If it comes to expanded area, I would go with a locking device. It's not going to give you the fixation. Yeah. But I that's agree with you. Yeah. And uh, I will uh, do a, a tension band wire through these holes in the process. An excellent, just like your petla fracture or your olecranon, it works extremely well, uh, tension band wire, and it neutralizes the forces there. And uh, it works extremely well. And as I said, you know, the abductor is not the problem of the, this patient. It is the subsidence. And hopefully this patient should get away with it because you have sized the stem quite nicely. This press fit is what really we are looking for. Yeah, well, I agree with you completely, Vijay, on the fact that the fixation should not depend on the length of the stem, but actually on the um, scratch fit that you get for about two to three centimeters. That is what is crucial in the fixation and prevention of sub subsidence. Now, one I'll just... Point, Pradeep, Pradeep, one more point. Whenever you yeah. use this modular stems, the junctional area needs to be supported with the bone. One important point to be given to the you know, delegates, that if you do not support the junctional area, there are chances of you know, fracture at the junctional area. So very true, stems, very true. And this, uh, this no, probably is not a good area. Uh, that, that, that comes with a little bit of a qualification. So the traditional uh, junctions are much lower down. Now this particular stem, uh, which is the uh, Titan, uh, what is the name of the stem? Uh, Pradeep, MR, uh, MRT Titan. MRP, MRP Titan, yeah. So here the junction comes much proximally. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, comes uh, comes uh, uh, distally, yeah. So it's quite different from the earlier stems. And uh, uh, I believe the history of entire English literature, this stem, there's only one uh, known fracture at the junction, yeah. So this stem is quite immune to that. So I mean, there is a lot of literature about yeah, the usage of these uh, modular stems for trochantric fractures. Again, the main reason why for these kind of, uh, these, are, these are for failed trochantric fractures, not for acute trochantric fractures. And the primary reason they say that is so that you can adjust the offset and the length. This is another paper again come from uh, the Ranawath group, um, again on failed trochantric fractures with modular hips. So it's been used and they've been quite successful. I think the learning teaching points are, if possible, as far as, you know, if it's, you don't have any length issues, a conical high offset stem should be more than sufficient. You'd like to bypass the last cruise. A modular stem can be used if you have a problem with non-union or if you're worried about length issues. And uh, wiring back the trochanter either with cables or with uh, plastic wires or what the other options is there. Regarding dual mobility, I just like to put up this particular slide just to discuss the options of hemiarthroplasty versus dual mobility. This was an 88 year old person with Parkinsonism who had a fall and had this fracture. You can see it's not just a basic cervical fracture, it's a pan trochantric fracture. Now I'm going to put up the slide as to what I did and then you can comment on that. Now what I've done here is, uh, sorry, is a cemented stem. I guess you could have used a, a Wagner stem, but I've used uh, dual mobility, the 88 year old lady, and you can see there's absolutely no trochanter or anything there to wire back. What do you think about a hemiarthroplasty versus a dual mobility here? In the 88 year old lady you know, with Parkinsonism. Rakesh? Um, 
I think uh, uh, Pradeep, I know people don't like uh, do uh, the bipolars, but uh, for me, uh, these ones are very good for bipolars. Okay, Vijay. I think the equ stability wise they are equally stable. Uh, you know, the jump distance is same for both or comparable between both. So um, I wouldn't mind putting a, a bipolar on this elderly lady. The um, you know, as I keep saying, the soft tissue continuity is there. I've done so many of these in acute uh, petrochondritic fractures. As long as soft tissue continuity is there, touch wood, we have never had any um, you know dislocation. So continuity is there. You know, it stabilizes on the lateral side. You'll be fine. Okay, the reason why I brought this up is, I mean, as far as the cemented versus cementless in this kind of acute fractures, there's enough literature to say that, you know, the rates of uh, the complication rates and the complication rates are more or less similar in acute fractures. But as far as dual mobility versus hemiarthroplasty, there's no literature as far as uh, trochanteric fractures goes. But as far as fracture neck of femur goes, there's quite a lot of literature coming up recently. For example, this one is dual mobility versus hemiarthroplasty or fracture neck of femurs. And here what they showed is that for the elderly frail person, the dual mobility hip provided better stability. But that is a retrospective study. This is another one, which is a prospective one, a randomized control study. For the elderly again, dual mobility versus hemiarthroplasty. And here again, what they showed was that the dislocation rates were significantly less in those with dual mobility. This is just a thought. There is no study as far as trochanteric fractures as to whether dual mobility is an option for these kind of neurologically challenged patients is just a thought. But hemiarthroplasty does equally well in most situations. But I think the take home message, I still do not believe that all unstable fractures should be treated with THR. There's enough literature, in several meta-analysis to say that there is no difference in the outcome in terms of mortality, in terms of length of surgery. Perhaps the key thing here is that you're able to get them up earlier and the time to wait bear is much earlier with the, with the hip replacements. Blood loss is probably much more with hip replacements. And this other same, uh, this is another uh, meta-analysis done by Mandeep Dillon, where he actually says PFNs actually do better for these unstable fractures. So as you can see, the outcome for unstable fractures, provided you have the technical skills to do it in trauma surgeons, can do, the patients can actually do pretty well. So in conclusion, probably, I mean, that's what you have these nails for, and there's a lot of debate about this, but for unstable fractures, the treatment of choice probably would still be a nail, whether you're going to be using a gamma type of nail or uh, the Smith & Nevy type of nail with two screws, that depends on the fracture pattern. But in pantrochantric fractures, I guess, where there's a high frailty index, where you want to get them up and going fast, or if there's technical difficulties, then you probably may consider a TH uh, replacement, a hemi or a dual mobility as, you know, you can think about it. Thank you. Pradeep, I think you can add one more indication to that. There are a lot of patients in, uh, in our country, women particularly with osteoarthritis knee, who have got a very bad varus nix. And when you try to put PFNs in these ones, they are not ideally made for that. Uh, their necks are less than 125 degrees, the neck shaft angle. So those ones I think are also better converted. And also I think this uh, 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 sort of power to go actually and fix everything, including putting a PFN, putting a plate outside, wiring it out, I think you're better off actually putting a replacement on that compared to doing all this. We have seen that life surgery being done like that. Yeah, uh, Mandeep, Mandeep Dillon is the chairman of AO India, I think. No, no. So I'm not surprised. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. The no, I think let he's me, not. Yeah, a, let uh, me let just make one point. Let me <laughs> make one point. Yeah. Now, uh, Pradeep, you mentioned that uh, the only difference may be early weight bearing. I mean, that patient, 88 year old patient, is the difference between life and death, early weight bearing. It's not like a 40 year old where, you know, delayed weight bearing or early weight bearing has got no consequence. But 88 year old patient, delayed weight bearing and early weight bearing is the difference between life and death. It makes all the difference. Absolutely. Let me share my... As well. uh, kind of a comparison we made in about 25 cases, we did a PFN. And before that, I was very fond of doing a bipolar in all these trochanteric fractures. We followed them for two years. And at the end, we looked their all Charles and comorbidity index. We looked at their uh, American with this ASA scores and everything. And at the end of two years for these cases, we found it out that fixations were better than bipolars at every outcome. At every outcome. It was not better with bipolars as we expected. And I was very keen to it. The uh, PFN were done by my colleague. And these were done by me. But still, 
the outcome of those cases were much better than as vijay saying it's it's what we want the patient is to be up sitting may not be walking but he should not be lying down or she should not be lying down and that all is possible and in these days depending on case to case with pfn we are making them walking the next day also so walking with pfn is not difficult at all it is equally good as with we do with the bipolars also so i personally feel it out wherever the fixation can be done i mean it's not a very grossly unstable or that kind of pfn is still the choice whether i am a yo man or not a man it's <laughs> just check it out no, so that's Mr. a Campbell, what... past i said uh, that i will be fixing this fracture but there are a specific subset of patients sir, where i think your hunch tells you that even after fixation you won't be able to make this patient walk and i think that is where uh, we are saying that it is better to actually cut rather than putting a pfn a plate and wire all around just to make extra look reasonably like it's a proximal femur reconstructed but you still can't make them walk exactly there will be cases but then yeah, it is better of doing a hemiathoplasty yeah. dr yeah. campbell can you share with us your experience You talk about the uh, the various necks. What about a valgus osteotomy? That used to be a great operation, and we do it sort of unintentionally sometimes. Both of the ones you showed, Pradeep, would have been candidates for it. Did I, uh, sir? Were you trying to say that convert that valgus into a valgus osteotomy, and then yeah, you... yeah, a valgusing yeah. so osteotomy. That can. you need different implants and i think uh, last time when i was trying to look for those implants in my place i had only one synthesis pediatric valgus plate i didn't even have implants available anymore for that oh no we just use use a like a normal sliding screw just put it up the femoral neck and connect it to a normal um dynamic hip screw plate it's nothing special just tip them uh, up a little bit I think it's a uh, past twelve in Australia now. Let's quickly finish up my presentation. Okay, and, uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> Dr. Campbell is still awake. <laughs> guy is talking. Just about. In continuation with this same, uh, you know, discussion about uh, you know doing uh, arthroplasty in intertrochoidal fracture, uh, I'll just show a quick, you know, technique-based video on bipolar arthroplasty in intertrochoidal fracture. and uh, this actually concept was uh, from professor n s lard who was our past president of indian arthroplasty association as well as uh, past president of indian orthopedic association so the exact indications that uh, you know when patients old age patients beyond 75 years with four part intertrochoidal fractures associated with osteoporosis these are the exact indications and if you see this kind of fractures the you know failure rate of the fixation is very high as you can see in this kind of cases so the problem is you know when you do arthroplasty in this kind of cases the problem is the version you can see this kind of x rays like this it may be dislocation because the vertical offset or the height has not been maintained so hip may dislocate or thirdly there may be you no know, breakage of the wires and leading to dislocation again and at last combination of this there's a problem with the version here dislocation as well as associated with infection so hip arthroplasty is effective procedure but it's technically challenging and this short video is going to oh, i'm going to show you so most important thing is that you know this is uh, suppose the pre operative x ray of that patient so go by posterior lateral approach the exposure and uh, next uh, you need to go through the fracture site this is not a trans trochanteric window so go through the fracture site this is the trochanter on this side this is the shaft on this side so when you go through the fracture site directly you will see the neck and you have to release the capsule all around the neck so that is known as pan release of the capsule which is attached to the neck and sometimes you know this calcar fragment it becomes difficult at you know uh, it doesn't allow the fragment to come out you may have to nibble out that calcar fragment or else you put your cur through or you put a you know owl there if it is osteoporotic bone then you can remove the head and uh, you can do a release of the capsule all around so after the head comes out as i can i told you that a calcar sometimes uh, you know puts you in problem then you measure the size of the head as to what kind of head you are going to you know use so this is a sizer so you see that it is going through that uh, you know 43 or 45 it becomes loose i am showing in a locally manufactured bipolar prosthesis which most of uh, in our country people would use 
then you use these two spikes remember there should be at least in a right angle between these two spikes in order to support the shaft fragment next you find the canal you can put a artery force there these are porotic bones usually but sometimes you know you find a small fragment of bone obstructing the canal so take out that bone fragment or else you know your cementing will be difficult or you may not be able to put the stem next to find the canal with a spread you know t handle there and next you do the broaching and while broaching remember this is the version you have to look for look for the you know uh, leg and with the leg your uh, you know anti version should be maintained that uh, it should be you know facing towards the floor so while putting the broach again you see that how much the broach is remaining out put your trial prosthesis in and see that how much are you know trial prosthesis exposed there so you have to take the scale and measure that how much it is from the from the remaining the shaft fragment so that the distance you want to we must measure do a trial reduction there so after you do a trial reduction give a push and pull to look for the you know how much tissue laxity is there so you oppose your trochanter and check it there so next very important thing that after you dislocate from your trial reduction don't take out the stem immediately because there will be some amount of subsidence there of this stem inside the canal so there you measure your length again the vertical offset or length from the shaft fragment so next to prepare to you know wear your trochanter so normally i make a hole there in the lateral cortex and make a double loop wear there before doing the cementing and uh, there so one of uh, the wire goes anteriorly one goes posteriorly and the loop remains out on the lateral cortex of the femur we take the nibbler and just mold the wire so that uh, you know introduction of the cement and stem will be easier next i measure the stem length and put the heading restrictor or you know canal restrictor there to the desired length next you wash the canal properly so after you put the heading restrictor you have to prepare the canal wash the canal with adequate you know normal saline or you can use your pulse lavas before you use that you can again take the trial stem and see that your uh, heading restrictor has gone to desired length and again you measure the vertical offset so repeatedly you have to measure that in order to keep your you know length of the stem intact you wash the canal and normally i pack with the hydrogen peroxide ribbon gauze pack there before the cementing so you pack the canal there now mix your cement i always use a palaco cement uh, for all my cemented uh, hips so mix the cement and uh, load the cement in the syringe use a gun and syringe that is useful so put it inside the syringe there and when the cement doesn't gravitate down next you put the gun and syringe inside the canal and do a you know distal to proximal filling of the cement so quickly you put the cement inside fill the canal next you break that nozzle and do a pressurization of the cement there if it is especially old patient then uh, do not do a very you know good pressurization so do a hand packing finally with the whatever cement is remaining next you put your final cement in and then you put your pre coated stem there so whatever cement is remaining you can coat the stem while putting the cement next you put your thumb near the medial side of canal again finally after putting the stem take out whatever extra bit of cement there take the scale and measure the length of the stem which remains out and of course you look for the version as per the position of your leg so the two most important thing is the version and length of the stem here and one important point is that sometimes because the proximal metaphyseal part is exposed the stem may be varus or valgus position try to keep the stem opposed to the lateral cortex of the femur if it is there around so you measure the length again the vertical offset and accordingly you can select your you know head size there then do a trial reduction as you can see here almost in 70 to 90 degree of internal rotation that hip is dislocating that that is the final implant inside c2 now i'll show you the trochanteric wiring so the anterior wire one posterior wire, you clean the trochanter there just to there and pass the anterior wire posteriorly and pass the posterior wire anteriorly so after you bring out these two wires next you pass through the loops 
so again the enterware comes posteriorly and posteriorly goes through the loop anteriorly next you tighten these wires so that is the way that is almost a part of the writing turn technique of wiring then you tighten the wires after you tighten the wires then you check again with the movement that your trochanter is not moving so that is a proper tightening of the wires next you do your closure so that is how your x ray looks like so this is your x ray in the ap view as you can see here the cementing and the wiring of the trochanter how the trochanter sits both in ap and lateral view so take home message that go to the trans trochanteric window do a pan release of the capsule take out of the head bdly look for the version and the height of the stem and lateral wall do a proper wiring technique so look for the limb length and the stability and this is little technically difficult surgery thank you for a patient hearing thank you dr manti any question on that so branch for the standard uh, uh, cemented hip in trochanteric fractures should yeah. the uh, normal uh, uh, standard uh, cemented stems be okay or you want a bigger bigger stems no uh, if the standard trochanteric fracture if you are using cemented stem then uh, it's all right that you use a cemented stem and usually the cemented stems like you know they are 15 cm length so Uh, i use a standard uh, cemented stem if i use a uncemented stem then i use a longer stem like uh, many times uh, many times the proximally you don't have the trochanter to give you that cement compression yeah. so this is why i was asking are you still happy with your standard uh, uh, yeah whatever stems? part of the stem remains almost two third of the stem remains inside the canal so that part gives you stability and that is adequate enough rather than doing a long cemented stem the literature definitely says that it should be long stem even cemented one also i mean what the literature says don't yeah i don't want to compromise the canal with a long cemented stem and uh, also giving the you know complications of cementing itself well, it's just a bit longer uh, i think what dr sen yeah. saying i think that's why exeter's got a special uh, trauma stem for these fractures yeah okay Uh, so, I think it's uh, so late, Dr. Sen. You can give your conclusion. Dr. Sen can wrap up. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, I just need that we. Dr. Campbell is asleep already. Yeah. <laughs> so first of all, I must thank Dr. David Campbell to have uh, spared such a important time and taking time off the sleep also. So thanks a lot for joining over here and Dr. Nathapal also because uh, it has been uh, little late for you also as compared to us. because for us it is still a quite a good time so thanks a lot for participating in this and uh, we do hope that we have our own good faculty around and uh, thanks to dr vijay dr mahesh dr kulkarni dr pradeep and deputy dr mahanti is always there <laughs> so thanks a lot and thanks a lot to the smith nephew who had been able to organize all the logistics of this webinar and definitely we have all the thanks to them also and this announcement from dr mahanti for the next yeah thank you dr sen uh, on behalf of indian orthoplasty association i extend my heartfelt gratitude to dr campbell dr natapal and all our indian faculty and uh, especially to professor sen for convening this uh, you know webinar and we thank uh, smith and nephew for supporting this webinar our next webinar number 9 will be on total knee orthoplasty in rheumatoid arthritis Dr. Ronan Roy and Dr. M. Ajit Kumar has kindly consented to become convenors for this, uh, you know, webinar which will be held on 20th of October 2020. Thank you very much and have a nice uh, evening. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Campbell and Dr. Dadpol. Grateful to you for participating. Yeah. Uh, good night, everybody. <laughs> Lovely to join the group. Thank you. Have a nice Thank you very day. Much. Good night. 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 Good